are getting the grand final between the two biggest stars in online chess, Hikaru Nakamura versus Magnus Carlsen. We are, of course, hoping for another Armageddon battle. And I'm now going to have our experts in the studio place their bets for what they think the winning bid for time in a potential Armageddon will be. So no peeking here. And Robert, what's your strategy here? Well, they're playing chess. We've seen Magnus Carlsen bluff. I think today they're going limbo. How low will they go? I think the answer is quite low. <sighs> well, what a day we have ahead of us. A big welcome, everyone, to the final day of the Air Things Masters and the Champions Chess Tour. Magnus really looking happy with himself. The king can't move. Wait, 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 wait. This it's move is breaking the rules. Whoa, everything under control, but suddenly the position has changed. This just looks glorious for white. Big choice from Arginero Geisen. There we go. The avalanche continues. There's a big threat on the board. He's taken Whoa, it. Magnus Carlsen is furious. He's going straight for the kill. Wesley so has blundered. He's blundered Whoa. his knight. The white king is trapped. This is checkmate oh. and it. Magnus Carlsen showing his genius. And again, Magnus Carlsen will have to show his genius because he has a tough task ahead of him today. A grand final against Hikaru Nakamura. And to safely guide you through all the action today, we have our experts in the studio. Grandmaster David Howell, International Ma Master Tanya Sachdev, and Grandmaster Robert Hess. And David, there's actually been a vote mm -hmm. on chess.com. Seems like Magnus Carlsen is a big favorite in the grand final. Do you agree? Uh, not necessarily. I think this is going to be tougher than it should be on paper. The reason that I feel so many viewers have voted for Magnus Carlsen is because he has already that lead. He's won a match and Hikaru needs to beat him twice in two matches in order to take the title. But uh, I do feel that it is Hikaru Nakamura. He will have a chance. Okay. Tanya, what should we expect from this grand final between these two? This is the most epic rivalry of modern chess of our times, Kaya. We've got the classical rapid and blitz world champion, the triple crown Magnus Carlsen, up against who is the best ever speed chess specialist of all times, Hikaru. Uh, what can we expect? The one, one thing is for sure, no quick draws. Every game is going to be a big fight. Hikaru is going to maximize every single chance on the board. And what are the chances, Robert, we will see Armageddon today, do you think? I think quite high because neither of these two has won a match in regulation, so to speak, because Magnus, he beat Arjun and then Hikaru in Armageddon. And Hikaru, he lost to Magnus in Armageddon and then beat Wesley yesterday. It's all been Armageddon. Yeah. And are you confident about your bid? No. <laughs> <laughs> I have the experts' predictions in here. I'm going to keep them in here until we have a potential Armageddon. And we're asking you at home as well to place your bid. What do you think will be the winning bid for time in a potential Armageddon? One winner will get a signed Air Things device. And actually, today, there is a special sale on Air Things. You get $100 off your Air Things Wave Plus. You can just scan this QR code and you're directed into the page where you can get your Air Things device to monitor air quality in your home. And uh, air quality is important for chess players, especially when they are playing at home. Day four yesterday, we had uh, we started out with the losers semifinals, which uh, was a battle between Wesley So and Arjun Aragaisi to go through to the losers final. I really like the way Arjun is playing. Wesley So is capable of playing energetic, dynamic style, but he's forced into it in this game. That's a sacrifice. He's just, I think he's forced to draw. This is just incredible. Wow. Uh, we were assuming he had to defend his rook, move his rook, or swap the queens. He says, no, just take my rook, please. He moves out of check, and that is a mark of genius, Wesley So. Now we see the position repeat itself. We have it. Wesley So goes through to face Hikaru Nakamura in the loser's final. We're off. It's the Italian game. This is what Wesley has been going to. It's his go-to opening. I do feel like this position is so solid for Hikaru. And there we have it. Hikaru missed it. Hikaru, look at Hikaru's face. He looked to the side. He was, oh, what is that? And he realizes that now he is going to face a terrible ending. Well, queen and rooks on the board, but a horrible pawn structure. That was a missed shot from Hikaru. Wow. wow. Like now. Oh. Could he have swapped queens there? Oh, and Hikaru saw it that. immediately. Hikaru. And he shot. Oh, my. And I shot. We've got to show that. It's a draw. They've repeated the position three times, wow. but Wesley could have won. He 
could have won if you didn't trade the queens off. What? The final move was a blunder by Wesley So. And, oh, uh, we should be firm on the board. It's happening, guys. Yo-yo between the queens, <laughs> and it's over. We have a draw. We're going to Armageddon. Look at Wesley So inching in with the queen. Next, his king is coming up to b4. He is kicking Black's pieces back. Hikaru was shaking his head. He hates his position. He hates what he's trying to defend. Look how the Black Queen is just causing a nuisance from behind here. So many weaknesses in Wesley's camp. Hikaru Nakamura needs just a draw, and it looks like Wesley might have missed a huge opportunity Shaking there. his head, Wesley. Now it's only 15 seconds seconds in it. This is just easy for Hikaru right now, and he's even ahead on time, right? He doesn't have any problems whatsoever. Hikaru, he knows he's got this in the bag. He's smiling. He's got a time advantage, and he clenches That's his it. fist. Wesley resigns. But Hikaru Nakamura makes it through to the grand final. He will face off against Magnus Carlsen. And also in the studio to guide us through this final day of the Air Things Masters, we have international master Ivan Kahowska and uh, Hikaru Nakamura. Even if he's been down on the loser's bracket, he's actually unbeaten in the tournament. He's really getting the hang of this uh, format, Ivanka. Yeah, the format seems to suit his resourcefulness, I would say. And I also have to say that he sussed, has sussed out the Armageddon bidding mm -hmm. because, you know, he did it perfectly against Wesley so twice. Incredible. Now, the grand final with Magnus Carlsen and Hikaru Nakamura in Division 1 is not the only grand final happening today in the Air Things Masters. Also in Division 2, two players will face off in a grand final. Fabiano, Corona, and you, Yang Yi. So do we have a big favorite in this matchup, Yvanka? I mean, it has to be Fabiano Corona who just needs to win this match in order to take uh, home the first place in Division 2 and also secure a spot into the next division in uh, the next tournament. Exactly. Um, Yu Yang Yi, he has a tough job ahead of him. He needs to defeat Fabi twice, which is really big ask because Fabiano has been winning all his matches wow. in just three games. What kind of a grand final should we expect in Division 2? with these two players? Well, it will be cagey, I think. Fabiano will, be, of course, be trying to lock things down, just keep it as solid as possible. Meanwhile, Yu Yang Yi, he has to be that agent of chaos. He has to up destabilize Fabiano. And you're going to keep us up to speed on everything happening in this grand final throughout the day, Ivanka. And let's take a look. What's at stake in the Air Things Masters? Uh, a total prize fund of $235,000. The winner of Division 2 gets $10,000, 50 tour points, and qualifies for Division 1 in the next event. The winner of Division 3 was actually decided yesterday, and Sam Sevian winning that got $5,000 and 20 tour points. Top three in Division 1 are guaranteed spots in the next event, and the winner takes home $30,000 and 150 tour points. That's going to be either Magnus Carlsen or Hikaru Nakamura. And Ivanka, we actually already know three out of eight players in the next event yeah. in uh, the Champions You mentioned or... two big names, you know, you have uh, Magnus, we have Hikaru, uh, throw in Wesley, and now we could potentially throw in Fabiano Caruana or Yu Yang Yi. That's just already insanely strong. So the next tournament is just going to be on fire. Oh, already yeah. looking forward to it. Uh, now, two days ago, Magnus Carlsen and Hikaru Nakamura, they faced off in the winners finally here in the Air Things Masters. Let's take a look at uh, what happened in that match. Oh, there we go. It started. This is the winner's final. Yeah. He goes for the more ambitious approach. Wow, that is making intentions very clear. Shots fired. Very surprised, I've got to say, that Hikaru looks so poker-faced on the camera because I would be terrified here for Black. How do you get that white pawn? It must be so frustrating. <laughs> Hikaru knows he's about to make a draw, and finally we see it. Wow. Here we go. Look at Magnus. He quickly responds with knight f6, challenging that rook on its place, and now that rook is really oddly placed. Are we going to see a repetition oh again? My God. Oh, are we going to see bishop b3, queen f5, bishop c2? It is happening. We are heading to Armageddon for sure. We are heading A. We've got lift off. Is that that h5 pawn and that's oh. a big blunder? Yes, because there's a tactic. Knight takes pawn on e5. What a that ball. is a game changer. Oh, he doesn't find it. He moves his knight away. Look at the evaluation bar dropping down in Black's favor. Those are two runners. And Hikaru, is he going to try and flag Magnus? The answer is no, it's a draw. Hikaru is actually the one who offered a draw. That's the ultimate sign of respect. That is a good show of sportsmanship. Magnus Carlsen wins the winner finals with a draw. 
And a big smile on his face there, Magnus Carlsen. And how much of a mental win was that, David? Winning actually the bidding in the Armageddon. It was huge. Not only did that Armageddon game decide their match, but uh, just that one second difference, the smile that uh, kind of was evoked by both of them. Magnus now is living in Hikaru's head a little bit. And uh, <laughs> if we come down to another bidding, that's the only chance, maybe the first chance that Hikaru will get to uh, exercise those ghosts. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at uh, the two players' road here to the grand final. We started out with quarterfinals. Magnus and uh, Hikaru both won their matches in dominant fashion. Magnus against Serana and Nakamura against Young Gukesh. In the winner's semi-finals, Magnus knocked down Eric Geisy to the loser's bracket. But Magnus, he did lose one game in that match. Hikaru Nakamura, he eventually won a tight battle against Wesley So. And then Magnus, he did win their winner's uh, final on Wednesday, knocking Nakamura down to the loser's final, where he once again faced off against Wesley So. And once again, it went all the way to Armageddon, where Hikaru Nakamura won the bidding. And with the black pieces, he got the results he needed. So here we are in the grand final. We might have a short and intense day. But it could also be a long day. Robert, what are the regulations here for the grand final? Yeah, we have a minimum of three games because if Magnus Carlsen comes out swinging and takes down Hikaru, first of two and a half points wins it. In the first match, we best of four. If Hikaru Nakamura takes down Magnus, we get a repeat, a second match, a best of two in that one. So that could be four games in the first one plus Armageddon, two games in the second match plus Armageddon. We have a maximum of eight games and it will be super exciting. Yeah, Hikaru has to win the first match. Tanya, will it affect the way he plays? 100%. We're going to see a completely different math strategy by Hikaru. Now, there are two things at play here. First, Hikaru has to make sure that he forgets about the fact that he needs to beat Magnus twice mm -hmm. to win the championship. He has to just focus on leveling the score, leveling the field in this first set. In fact, if he goes on to do that, Kaya, he will perhaps become a favorite mm. for that second set. We've seen him throughout the tournament so far to go for the match strat of just draw, happy with that, take it to the Armageddon, believes in his ability in that, and then crush his opponents there. Mm. But that's not going to work against Magnus. He has to make the most of every single opportunity, no quick draws, go for the wins with the white pieces. All right. It's uh, Norway against the US in the grand final of the Air Things Masters, but Magnus, he's also playing from the North American continent, visiting his uh, Chespra friends in Canada. Yesterday was a day off for Magnus. Uh, he did post on Instagram yesterday, definitely enjoying himself at the sports pub, playing chess and watching some sports. So he didn't reveal to us, uh, David, two days ago what he would do on his rest day. But do you think he's coming in relaxed and happy today? Yeah, Magnus is certainly very relaxed, certainly very happy. And uh, knowing him, he took his mind off chess, maybe doing some exercise. And I should say, Kaya, rest days in chess are not always a good thing. You do break your flow, you do break the rhythm sometimes. And especially when you're playing well, you want to keep going. So let's, so let's see whether Magnus can keep up that good form he showed before yesterday's day off. Could it actually be advantage, Hikaru? He's in the flow he played yesterday. Yeah, it was a tough match. So you're in the flow of chess, as you're saying. You're thinking chess nonstop, and that can help you instead of breaking the pattern where you just have a day off, your mind is off elsewhere, watching sports. So I do think that playing every day can be very helpful in the tournament of this magnitude. Yeah. There is no doubt these two are very even in the faster time controls. Uh, in the Speed Chess Championship in December, Hikaru won their battle in a very exciting match. And you commented on that, Robert. Can you describe that match? That commentator's curse aside, where Magnus blundered a bishop, <laughs> that was the start of the match. Hikaru jumped out to a huge lead. Magnus stormed back. But when all was said and done, it was just a little too much. Hikaru Nakamura, he won by one point. The timer ran out on Magnus Carlsen's comeback. Hikaru Nakamura was the deserving speech chess champion. Mm. And only about a week later, they played again in the Blitz World Championship. That was a draw. Magnus eventually, though, took the gold medal. And as we know, in the most recent battle here in the Air Things Masters winners final, Magnus won that one. So, what will it take for Hikaru today, uh, Tanya? 
Again, Kai, it all comes down to the kind of opening prep and the fighting spirit that Hikaru shows. Not having that max strategy of going into the armor, getting maxima maximize your chances in every single game. Now, even in this event, yes, Magnus beat Hikaru, but Hikaru didn't actually lose a single game. Mm -hmm. They had five draws. Hikaru has been unbeaten so far. Magnus Carlsen hasn't lost a single match, but he's lost one game in the process to Arjun Aragasi. Uh, there was a time back in the day when Hikaru had this huge mental block against Magnus. Magnus had a crushing score, but he has overcome that. In fact, in 2022, Hikaru did not lose a single game to the world champion. Wow, wow. That is uh, some amazing stats. We are waiting for the first game in the grand final to start. This is the head-to-head -head stats between them in rapid and blitz chess. Wow, that is a lot of games. And it is advantage, Magnus, David. Wow, Kai, I'm trying to do some quick maths <laughs> yeah. here, but uh, I'm struggling. That's a huge amount of games. And Magnus does have a significant lead, 91 to 51. I was expecting it to be closer, to be honest. Ooh. But uh, this isn't taking into account the recent history, uh, which, as Tanya mentions, isn't necessarily so one-sided. Magnus, maybe small advantage on paper, but uh, Hikaru making ground. And uh, here we go. We're about to start game one. Magnus with the white pieces, looking very slick there. And uh, I think he'll try and come out all guns blazing if he can as well. He doesn't want to just uh, take a solid approach. It's not his style. First time in a long time, I feel we've seen Magnus Carlsen actually comb his hair. <laughs> <laughs> Can that be it? I'm going to make my hair quality jokes. Uh, <laughs> yes. again, the hair things masters. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do know Magnus Carlsen, he has good air quality. Uh, air things is monitoring the air quality in the room he's sitting in uh, Canada. Sometimes, though, opening his window to get some fresh air, he is going to need perfect air quality today. His mind needs to uh, really work because Hikaru Nakamura is the toughest opponent you can face off against in online chess and uh, rapid and speed chess. Waiting for Magnus to make his first moves. Any predictions you guys for the first game? <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll steal the most likely first move. 1e4. Okay. <laughs> I'm going for 1d4. Okay. I feel out of options now. I'm going to have to go knight f3 just because they took the two most popular moves. <laughs> and Kaya. Well, I think Magnus uh, wants to get a mental advantage here and maybe shock Hikaru with something strange, which, I don't know, B B3, B4? Oh, yeah. he's done it, B4. Yeah. He's, uh, he's gone for that <laughs> opening. But uh, there we see, okay, air quality not so great Ooh, to start the day. Should open his window, maybe. Yeah, we've seen Magnus literally open his window after a loss against Aragaisi earlier in the tournament. Maybe he was aware that his air quality was affecting him, maybe feeling a bit stuffy in that room. Oh, and it was the English opening, and I was expecting you to guess that one, Kai, <laughs> oh, and God. so close. It <laughs> but was he something... did get it right. There yeah. was no e4, d4, or knight f3. He starts with the pawn in front of the bishop and moves it two steps ahead. But we might see a conversion there. Yeah, so a transposition, it started as an English opening, it can transpose into the Queen's Gambit declined, especially if White lifts his Queen's Pawn. Now we are back in the Queen's Gambit declined via a uh, different route. And, okay, which variation will Hikaru choose? He's played pretty much everything in this position. He normally keeps it solid, just develops the Black Bishop one square, the Black Dark Square Bishop gets castled and then solves his problems a bit later. But Hikaru looking off to the right now just... Uh, Choosing, just mm. uh, deciding what to play against Magnus. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he's predicted this. He's played it hundreds of times, Hikaru, but just deciding what mood he's in. Yeah, it's a big uh, day in uh, the Champions Chess Store. We have the very first grand final of the season, and we really, really want you guys to join in and uh, hang out with us here in the studio. You can share your thoughts, your questions for our experts in the studio, either on Twitter using the hashtag ChessChamps or in the Twitch chat. We will pay attention to that as well. Thank you for being with us on this big day in the Champions Chess Store, and let's have some fun. I feel like we've said our favorite Pokemon, Magnus and Card did the same. The chat probably has to get involved with that as I well. Know. I mean, we're talking about chess, but Pokemon has been a theme throughout the event. Definitely. And Kaya, you were saying, let's have some fun. Take a look at the position on the board. Uh, David, we were looking at lines where the bishop can develop, but Hikaru chooses none of that. He goes for the most dynamic option of picking up that central pawn, sacrificing that B pawn. This is a mess on the board. What is going on? Yeah, so this is a known variation, but I haven't known Hikaru to dabble in this one too much. Normally, he chooses a very solid approach. There we see Magnus push a pawn forward. So the Queen's Gambit accepted. It's a kind of branch of that now. Uh, showed 
Hikaru grabbing a pawn. He's given a pawn back, but not the typical pawn uh, that you would see Black offer in most variations. Here, Black has really ugly structure on the queen side, doubled C pawns, isolated A pawn, but he has a really juicy outpost for his knight in the middle of the board. And uh, whoever races out, gets developed first, tends to get the advantage here. I've always slightly preferred White's chances. You get more space, you have the more fluid structure, but Black, as Tanya said, very dynamic. And Hikaru clearly choosing this opening because of the match situation. It's part of his strategy to imbalance things and maybe even go for a win as Black. Uh, Robert, what do you think of this, uh, of this plan? I've always been a fan of this opening because it is so dynamic. Black has these doubled isolated pawns on the C file. We see the one next to the queen and the one sticking out pretty far on the C4 square. Uh, that said, as David was mentioning, the D5 square is firmly under Black's control. There's not a white pawn that can challenge the square and Black's light square bishop will slide onto the Fianchetto diagonal and take control over the board's longest line. So this is going to be good news for Hikari. He can castle queenside. His king will be safe there despite the advanced pawns. And that d4 pawn is a bit tender in white's position. All that being said, the double isolated c pawns remain weaknesses. Sometimes they get picked off and that could spell some trouble for Hikaru. So it's a double edged position. Chances for both. Yep, definitely chances for both. But uh, if this one does start to turn around, Hikaru's turning things in his favor, then Magnus might start to get nervous. A loss with white and the whole momentum, the whole initiative of the match would change. So Magnus here just developing his queen. Both sides staying very, very flexible. Hikaru here, if he wants to keep Magnus guessing, might develop his bishop and say, OK, I might go this way. I might go the other way, depending on what you do. But uh, as Robert says, it is very typical in this type of uh, position to commit to going long towards the queen side. And uh, it's surprisingly hard to attack Black's king on that flank. These Black Knights act as fantastic guardians of that king. And uh, if they protect it, then it's going to be very hard for Magnus to find a plan quite often. Uh, really interesting start to this game. I'm loving it. This is what we came for and we're getting action from the word go. Uh, as we've been talking just how dynamic this position is, David, we don't know which side Hikaru wants to put his king on. Will it be on the king side or the queen side? Either way, there's going to be danger. White can also look at certain pawn breaks on the queen side with moving that B pawn one step ahead and Magnus stops it forever with his last... Hikaru stops it forever with his last move. He jumps the knight forward. Uh, the one weakness that White had created with that A push is the B3 squared. That is where the knight has headed. We've been talking about not making intentions clear with the black king. And look at Hikaru's uh, last move. There is no queenside castling anymore. Hikaru is going for the attack for the initiative along the B file. Yep. Later on, he'll clear some pieces out the way and then a big target on the B2 square, backward pawn long term. So this does mean that both sides maybe intend to castle on the king side. And uh, we'll see if either side can attack on that flank later. And you were mentioning about clearing the way. One possible plan for Black to do that is step up with the bishop, do that c6 square, uh, uh, David, and then you want to bring your knight. Let's see if we can bring up the analysis board in a bit, but it's a very nice idea with that last move, making sure that you can attack the b2 pawn. The knight from b6 then can jump up to a4, offering some trades, taking away the pieces from white's queen side, and the play will be about flank attacks. Yeah, flank attacks, and uh, this pawn would be under uh, under watchful gaze here. And also, as uh, Tanya mentions, this would be a nasty skewer if this does happen. So Hikaru's plan, what's he going to go for? Is he just going to move his bishop out of the way and castle? Safety first approach, or will he go a bit more aggressive and start landing blows already on that side of the board? Um, really interesting start. And uh, yeah, did you expect this, Robert? I must admit, I thought Hikaru would just try and hold with black and press with white, but he hasn't been pressing hard with white so far this <laughs> tournament. And... Wow, <laughs> I think we're both shocked by this last move. Yeah, you asked me my expectations. I wasn't quite expecting the pawn push. It does make sense. You're just saying, are you sure you want to castle kingside for Hikaru? Because if you castle there, white is going to launch an attack. Uh, your initial question, did I expect this opening? Absolutely not. I expected the type of opening, though, because Hikaru Nakamura has said this in the past, and so many other players have as well, that a lot of people are afraid of Magnus Carlsen, and that helps him win games, that psychological edge. Hikaru is not afraid. He knows how good Magnus is. We saw the head-to-head -head record. Hikaru has lost maybe more games than anybody to Magnus Carlsen, but he's also beaten him perhaps more times than anybody else has. So he is ready to bring the fight to Magnus, and he plays Tanya's move, bishop c6. Uh, the knight may slide out next, as we were showing in some previous lines. Uh, but perhaps Magnus Carlsen is going to take a page out of, uh, was it Gukesh's book? Mm -hmm. Sliding his king one square over. Instead of castling, he will lift his rook later, but for now he might just slide his king to the side. 
Yeah, and talking of Gukesh, I've seen Gukesh play this idea of pushing the pawn forward in this exact opening, this exact structure, uh, multiple times. But uh, also your point, Robert, who beats Magnus Carlsen once, let alone 51 times? And that's just <laughs> Rapid and Blitz Chess. That's and uh, that's just official tournaments. They've played plenty, of course, online and uh, kind of friendly matches as well. So, um, yeah, imagine beating Magnus 51 times right. and still having a, a, uh, a losing record. Wow. Incredible stats. You know, I think in sporting history, we've always got these epic matchups and these great rivalries mm. that go down in history books. So if we think about boxing, there's Muhammad Ali versus Joe Frazier and their big fight. Yeah. More recent history, there is Federer versus Nadal oh, and yeah. their battles on court. And when we think about speed chess, Today and in the future, when we will talk about speed chess, these are the two names that will come to our mind. Their fights, it will be Magnus Carlsen and Hikaru Nakamura. Incredible. Yeah, it's, uh, it's like Messi and Ronaldo after, mm -hmm. their, after their picture recently where they literally acted as these two uh, <laughs> with that position across the board from one of their uh, epic battles, I think, in Norway chess a few years back. Uh, I can't remember who was Messi, who was Ronaldo, but either way, two greats, two goods. Magnus was, uh, Ronaldo picked the Magnus position mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, Messi had the Hikaru position. So yeah. how lucky Ronaldo and Messi are to get to uh, be Magnus yeah. and Hikaru. That's one way of putting it for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, this position, it really is a messy one. And, yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm going to give you hey. that. It's very nice. <laughs> but it is the type of position that Hikaru wants against Magnus. We saw in their first matchup in the winner's final that Magnus was getting these slight pulls. Hikaru's position was not very dynamic. He had to sit and wait for what Magnus was trying to accomplish. And here Hikaru says none of that. Magnus, you had the day off yesterday. Perhaps you weren't looking at chess, and I was. He prepared this line, and look at Magnus. He's saying all steam ahead. Let's go. Push that pawn forward. H5. Maybe that pawn will go forward even further to H6. Just try, try to create a dent in Black's king size structure. All that said, I mean, Black's play is very quick with this knight A4 jump. The B2 pawn is already under attack. So Magnus has his work cut out for him. Yeah, and he needs a solution to this move. This is clearly part of Hikaru Nakamura's plan right now uh, to launch an attack on the queen side. And I'm not seeing it immediately. I've got to admit uh, how we comfortably defend this pawn. I don't really want to, for example, drop the bishop back to defend it. That would make a very sad piece of the white bishop. And uh, if not, then black has a serious threat. Rook takes pawn. Remember, as uh, Tanya pointed out, knight takes knight is not really feasible unless you want to sacrifice material. Knowing Magnus, he would be okay with sacrificing. I've seen him sacrifice far more for far less uh, in return. But yeah, right now it's so dynamic. So many tactics already in the player's mind, and we're only at move 15. Mm. Uh, they've played fast up to this point, but they're going to go into the tank for longer because it is so messy, so chaotic. <laughs> right now. As sad as it might seem, I think, uh, David, you just cannot drop that B2 pawn, so we might see a retreat with that bishop that you were pointing out. And we do see an attack on both sides. The queen side is where Hikaru's got his forces. The king side is where Magnus is trying to rush down with that uh, H pawn. On. So a really incredibly dynamic position and very often with these top players uh, in chess, we see that their moves make sense when you look at them backwards. Uh, the plan that Hikaru shown on the queen side and we were talking about the knight jumping onto a4 to clear the b file, but Hikaru has something else in mind. He decides to force a trade off and create an imbalance by exchanging the bishop for the knight. Wow, interesting decision. I'm very biased towards my bishop, so that wasn't even on my radar at all. These top players, they know when to make exceptions, when to kind of uh, forget their prejudices. And uh, yeah, now this queen trade, what do we think? Should we have a vote? Are the queens coming off? He no. can't. White can't <laughs> go for a queen trade because let's take a look at this. If you do go for the queen trade, the knight picks it up and now the b2 pawn is just super vulnerable, David. Mm -hmm. This would be bad news for white because notice how the rook and the knight, two attackers, currently zero defenders, you might just end up being a pawn down in this endgame. Yeah, and uh, therefore we're assuming Magnus to dodge the queen trade. I'm just wondering how because there are downsides, uh, there are drawbacks to every square you want to put this queen on. If you move it, for example, one squared forward, you might get hit by a knight. If you slide to the side, you might get hit by the other knight. Um, ideally, you want to use the central square, but then you're abandoning the whole of your queen side to their fate. And uh, these pawns will drop off. Maybe you can go on an attack, switch focus to the other flank, but committal decision now for Magnus. But a very Magnus move would be to trade queens, not by capturing. We keep talking about this. Akai, you've asked the 
question, and so has the chat. When do you trade pieces? You do it on your own terms. So the rook can slide over one square and say, let's trade on c2. That looks a lot better, because if the queens come off the board, now that pawn on c4 is under direct attack. Black can't just force uh, focus all of his forces on the b2 pawn, because both the knights are needed to defend this pawn on c4. I actually think this would be an advantageous position for Magnus, so I don't think Hikaru really wants to trade the queens. He would only do it under favorable circumstances, and that would be landing his pieces very quickly up the queen side. Mm, yeah. Okay. That's important, just everything on your own terms. You, you know what your opponent wants, you know what you want, but you have to make sure that uh, it's only uh, in circumstances that favor you. And uh, Magnus going into the tank thinking now but about if, level time. If Magnus did take the black queen right now, would Hikaru then take back with the black knight and have both his knights on the rim? Wouldn't that be kind of bad for Hikaru? I think uh, in general it's not a great idea, but right there, just specifically and concretely, it's because white's B2 pawn would drop off. There's mm -hmm. no way to save it, as Tanya was pointing out. So uh, you're right, Kaya. Normally, you want to strand your opponent's knights on the side of the board, especially when you have strong bishops, as white does. But uh, Robert predicts it correctly. You can allow a queen trade, but on your own terms. Mm -hmm. There, the black knights would have actually been surprisingly strong. Uh, we've got this move that Robert was suggesting and my heart's beating really fast because uh, guys what happens if the black knight jumps on to b3 you got to move that rook away the knight falls back the rook comes back the knight comes forward uh, we might see a little dance do you think there is a potential for a repetition here oh wow <laughs> we've <laughs> predicted it before we've got two prophets here in the studio Tanya and Robert and the knight has jumped in hitting this rook if the rook moves Black does have the opportunity to slide back. Second time we've seen this, and as uh, Tanya's also mentioning, the rook moves, the knight moves. Knight b3 him. on the board, Let David. But the rook slid the other direction. So Magnus is saying, let me just show up my weakest point. That pawn on b2 is exactly what black is going after. And now if the knight retreats, the queen can, in fact, dart to the center of the board and over to the king side because you protected your weakness. The rook looked more active on d1, but this is a position that calls for defense, then switching into offensive gear. I like what Magnus is doing here. And you could sense by Hikaru's time management, he's starting to think and his hands on his head. He knows that this is a big moment and he can't just go back and forth because Magnus is not going to repeat. Yeah, really nice move there and uh, not intuitive at all. But again, that's why the top players are so good. They're happy to play passive moves if they really need to. They know when to be flexible, when to go on the attack, when to be active, when to sacrifice, but also when to take a timeout uh, to just hold everything together. And uh, I saw Hikaru on Twitter. He called it Groundhog Day playing Magnus yet again. Uh, do you think he fully believes in his chances uh, today? I just love how brave he's been in this opening. A hundred percent. I mean, just the way he's been playing, he knows what he needs to do to win this match. He needs to beat Magnus not once, but twice. Uh, and while it's a start, the kind of position that he's gotten, extremely dynamic. Now, he gives a check. He gives a check, doesn't fall back with the knight. And look at the way he's playing such aggressive moves. Every move is a piece forward. Uh, just incredible stuff. Hikaru knows that level one today is to first create chances in the first set not to think about that final reset uh, that he will get. And I think he's done everything right with the black pieces. It's not easy to get this kind of a position against Magnus Carlsen. Yeah, it's a cliche, right? You take it game by game, move by move, but that's what Hikaru has to do. Uh, he is taking significant risks, however. He's playing very aggressively, but he has abandoned his king side and Magnus takes the opportunity to step forward. Now watch out. In any endgame, that white H-pawn is very close to promotion. The number of times I've seen Magnus promote his A or H-pawns after marching them forward uh, this far, and only now does Magnus clarify the central tension. He trades off a pawn. Uh, also, the Black King wants to castle at some point. It can't stay in the center forever. It blocks uh, the connection between the two rooks. So when, Ma uh, when Hikaru eventually does castle, uh, to the king side, his king will always have mating threats against it with this structure. But what about Magnus? What is his plan with his king? His king is going to have to stay put for a little bit, but that C4 pawn, that's the tender one. Uh, Black got rid of one of his double isolated pawns, and he might lose both. He traded off the one that was less advanced. Now the one that was sticking out might just fall. So I think Magnus, he's not thrilled about his king's placement, but there aren't Black forces aiming at it, right? The king has so many of those minor pieces keeping it safe and sound. So the C4 point, I believe, is going to drop next. Maybe it's pre-movable at this point. Yeah, it's almost pre-movable unless your opponent plays a really surprising move and <laughs> attacks your queen or something. But uh, yeah, Robert, so no matter how Black recaptures this pawn, he's temporarily down a pawn. Uh, we're expecting him to take this one back. If he takes with the bishop or with the knight, the two most logical moves, you're expecting uh, this pawn to suddenly drop off. So if, let's say knight takes pawn, white recaptures, and not only have you won a pawn, suddenly threats on the board. 
Actually, you're right. Maybe it is that simple right now. Do you think Hikaru's just misjudged something here, miscalculated? Or is there a way to justify uh, going down a pawn now? When someone offers a trade, and then after that piece is taken, they start thinking, mm -hmm. it feels like they might have misevaluated the uh, sequence of events. So Hikaru is probably trying to figure out how to deal with this, because if we just go down this line for a second, yes, the pawn structure will probably be compromised after a knight takes bishop, a queen takes knight, and then bishop takes e3 here. But there are all sorts of threats. The queen can go up to c6 with check, preventing black from castling. Uh, that king is actually getting hunted right away. If the king slides over, the queen just goes to d6 with check and hits the rook, winning the game on the spot. Maybe this is what uh, Hikaru overlooked, because otherwise he would have a reasonable position, but the queen delivers that fatal check, and the rook will be hanging at the end of the day. Yeah, you're right, Robert. Maybe he just assumed that Magnus had to recapture this bishop now. The black king gets time to run to safety, and uh, white is left with uh, ruinous pawn structure, especially these two weeks long term. I do slightly prefer white here, but uh, at least black has a, a decent share of the chances. Okay, he's gone for this line, so we might well see after bishop takes pawn, Magnus just recapture, just go a pawn up, and threats against the black king. Looking uh, very, very shaky for Hikaru right now, down two and a half minutes as well. Uh, let's see whether he finds a solution. Magnus didn't take that pawn yet. Surprising, I've got to say, but uh, still looks like a decent position. He trades off bishops instead, and uh, there we go. He beat me to it. I was about to say, <laughs> normally having an uncastled king is a problem because your rooks aren't connected, but here it doesn't matter. White's rook is able to get up the board and start attacking across, and uh, very effective. And there's a sick tactic here. Like, let's bring up an analysis board, because if black tries to defend this pawn on c4, it's under attack three times, you want to bring a piece to defend it. You bring your knight back to a5. White pushes this pawn up to b4. Normally, you could take en passant. It is a legal move, but you'll notice that the, the pawn is the only thing blocking the queens from staring at each other. So if you take en passant here, you actually lose your queen on c5. And if you don't take that pawn en passant, you're losing a knight because there is a fork. So the rook h4 is especially clever. Just going right after the c4 pawn, black's knight is unable to retreat. That spells trouble for Hikaru Nakamura. He is going to go down a pawn in this position. Yeah, really sneaky, and the only other way to defend it is to shuffle your rook across, and here, I guess, as Magnus Carlsen, you can just take this pawn anyway. So the tactics are two, uh, twofold there, and uh, after the knight recaptures the bishop, now you take the other knight, and you've got a pawn ahead. Maybe this is uh, damage limitation, this is what Hikaru needs to do at some point, try to get your king castled, but suddenly the tactics all working out in white's favor, and that's a red flag, that's a bad sign. When all of these two, three movers are working in your opponent's favor, you need to start panicking. You need to start uh, just trying to control things. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, remember, everyone, we do have a competition uh, for everyone today. If we end up with Armageddon, what do you think will be the winning bid? You can tweet your answer using the hashtag ChessChamps, and uh, the one who gets closest will win a signed AirThings device signed by Magnus Carlsen. Our experts in the studio have also placed their bid. I have them safely in my envelope. Did you place a bid, by the way? I didn't place a bid. Oh, I'm just, so I'm... you can't be wrong. So sneaky. Oh, nope. <laughs> I like it that way. <laughs> Just having your fate in my envelope. Yes. Uh, currently, it looks like it's Hikaru's fate, right? Because this position, we've been praising his opening approach and just what a mess he created. Uh, but now it just looks like it's somewhat backfired a little bit because he's down on the clock by almost five minutes already, barely out of the opening, which means that the biggest questions are still to come and still to be answered. Uh, the C4 pawn under fire, as we can see, the queen, the bishop and the rook, all three pieces hitting it. Uh, and very importantly, black cannot just shift the rook, defend it, because regardless of that, perhaps we can just really quickly show this line that you were pointing out, David, where if black defends it with the third piece, and I see that Hikaru is reaching out for his mouse, he's about to make a move, then white can pick up the c4 pawn with the bishop, you pick it up with the knight, and the knight on b3 hangs. So he would have lost the pawn anyway, and instead, Hikaru decides to first bring his king to safety. But the big question always in these position is, how safe is that king? Look at that pawn on h6. Imagine at some point white's queen lands on f6. Once it gets there, the queen on f6, these dark squares that are super weak, there will be a mate on g7 that you'll have to watch out for for the rest of the game. Black needs to be extremely careful. White picked up the pawn. Hikaru has gone to move that rook, pinning the bishop. But can the knight be picked up on b3? I think it can, and it most likely will. And uh, 
The only question here for Magnus is which way do you capture? Uh, you could take this knight with your queen, allowing the black knight to jump in. And this is a superior version of what we looked at earlier for black because suddenly both your rooks are active. Suddenly all of your pieces really, really well placed. And uh, OK, looks like we've gone in the other direction. Sorry, just to backtrack. After bishop takes, I was expecting queen takes queen here, I've got to say, and heading into an endgame. But white would have had an extra pawn. Instead, Hikaru gives a really sneaky check, hitting the white king. Just in time, Magnus is able to go and block with his queen. His queen was also under fire, and now the bishop falls. And this is the current position. White's still a pawn up. Yeah, I think we were expecting that queen trade because of the activity black would have received. But the problem with black's position is this pawn on h6. It's not just trying to deliver a checkmate right now. Even without queens on the board, we could see a future where there's back rank checkmate threats, and that's bad news for Hikaru's king. And that is probably why Hikaru says, I need more pieces on the board. But with those pieces on the board, and we just see uh, Magnus's rook slide across, the b4, hitting the queen, protecting that extra pawn. I mean, that pawn is ultra well defended. And now Magnus continues to improve his other pieces. Watch out for Hikaru's king, but for now he is quite active, trying to create threats against the white queen side. Yeah, I'm expecting uh, just to block this open file, as you mentioned, some uh, threats later on of getting the rook behind. So block this open file, place your knight on a really nice square. And for example, if we do see a rook trade, at least you have an active rook here threatening this pawn in conjunction with your queen. You have a very well-placed knight. And for now, it looks like you've got an element of control. Um, still a pawn down, however, still maybe uh, preference for white, but uh, you're, in, you're in the game. And David, exactly this line, I think it demonstrates Robert's idea so well that here black is hitting with the rook and the queen, the pawn and b2, but white doesn't need to bother with it. You can simply take the open c line for your rook. Always place your rook on open files. And now we see why that b2 pawn cannot be picked up and the power of that h pawn on the other side of the board, you deliver a checkmate on the back rank. Yeah, really nasty stuff. Uh, the tactics will continue. I mean, this type of thing is something that Hikaru have to worry about for the rest of the game. Let's go back to him. He's down to two minutes now. It's a five-minute difference between the two players and looking grim. Is he in big trouble? Uh, big is an understatement. I think he's in huge trouble because, wow. remember, against Magnus Carlsen in the winner's final, game one, uh, Magnus won a pawn and had a great chance in the end game, but he didn't have enough time, and Hikar put pressure on Magnus's clock. Here, Magnus is ahead on the clock. He's up a pawn. His king is safer. I just feel like everything going right for Magnus Carlsen, he is surely going to take this game one. If he doesn't, he is going to be absolutely devastated. Uh-huh. Yeah, and uh, Hikaru, against anyone else in the world, he would feel confident about his defensive chances. But here, clearly, the reason he's burning time on the clock is because he hates his position. And uh, not only are you a pawn down, also checkmating ideas against your king. It's, uh, wow. yeah, multiple reasons. And the clock, he's now down to almost just a minute. And Magnus has got over seven minutes. That's a huge time advantage in a super difficult situation. We've often spoken about how one of the biggest strengths of Hikaru is his resilience, his resourcefulness. And he needs to show that now more than ever. Mm -hmm. I just don't know what to do because we keep talking about this white pawn on h6, which is threatening. Uh, we talk about if a queen lands up in the attack, then white knight can also help out and go for the attack. We were quoting Taylor Swift yesterday. I mean, white horses, right? <laughs> Land me oh, a, yeah. a white horse on f6. That's bad news for the Black King. So Hikaru lashes out with his pawn push to a5. Look at how quickly, though, Magnus is responding. And Hikaru needs to have his moves ready quickly because he's down under a minute on the clock and he remains a pawn down wow. on the board. Amazing speed there by Magnus. It just feels like he's playing on all sides of the board. And now that knight can jump up to g5. Also opening up the f line for the queen to land on to try and put pressure on the white side. He's playing on all sides of the board. Magnus has got this rook on b5, which takes control of the queen side. Any activity against the b pawn, while the other rook and the queen and the knight, uh, the arrows that you're drawing, David, exactly point out to the idea that queen from f3 will threaten that pawn also threatened to jump onto F6 and that mate that we've been talking about on the G7 square. Yeah. Big trouble here for Black. I've said it so many times, once the opponent's queen is this far distanced from her own king, you need to go on the attack. You need to target that enemy king uh, while you have the opportunity here. It takes Black's queen three or four moves minimum to get back to any potentially defensive square. And uh, this looks like a devastating move, Tanya, the one you're mentioning, bringing the knight forward. And uh, Magnus, I think, will go for that. I could also imagine a very Magnus type of move would be to just shuffle the king towards the corner, towards safety, just to avoid any potential checks long term. Black's queen could come back and annoy the king on this diagonal at some point. So uh, just prophylaxis, as we say, just get the king to safety and the tactics still working in White's favor. But 
yeah, no matter what, no matter what move he chooses right now, looking very promising for White. A good moment, I feel, for Magnus to stop and invest some time. Uh, still five minutes up on the clock with a very, very strong position. Remember, this is best out of four rapid games. And if Magnus wins the grand final match, he will be the winner of the Air Things Masters. Hikaru Nakamura, he has to win this match to get a second chance and take it to a grand final reset. And we are enjoying uh, you guys watching this together with us. Look at that. Colin! He's actually watching this in class. <laughs> Naughty. <laughs> but we like it. He's doing all the right things, yes. Kaya. <laughs> calculus. Ugh. I agree. I agree. I like calculus. Was that your favorite mm. uh, subject? No, but I liked it. I mean, call me a nerd. I'm a chess grandmaster, so I can't really hide it. But a calculus was fun. So some people need calculus. It's yes. a good subject. I'll take chess stupid. over calculus, David, <laughs> any day of the week. Kaya, you were saying how Hikaru needs to win the match. Right now, he's thinking about how on earth does he save this position. And the more I look at it, the more hopeless it feels, David. Mm -hmm. And we've been discussing all these mating ideas, and Magnus steps up with his queen to the center of the board. I get the feeling that because of the mating nets that we've been showing, the king, the black king just caged up on the king side, Hikaru might not have any better choice than to offer a queen trade, but yeah. the end game is no better for him. And uh, you predicted it correctly, Tanya, and you're right, it's no better for him. Still just insurmountable problems, it feels like, with the Black King on the back rank. Maybe if the Black King was closer to the centre again, an active king in the end game, uh, he would have some chances, but this one, I already see some trouble. There's some variations here, which I think will land on the board. Magnus is happy to just trade one set of rooks because that black rook is stuck. It has to defend passively the back rank, and now Magnus will start getting his pieces into the game, starting, I think, with rook lift. Casey Bell in the Twitch chat saying Magnus has a bunch of winning moves. Is that the case, basically? Yeah, it's hard to go wrong for Magnus because uh, black is completely tied down. The rook for black will likely slide next to the king, and just going back to the castle position to defend this tender f7 pawn because White's forces are just jumping forward and going to go for the attack. So Magnus knows he's winning. Hikaru also understands that Magnus should be winning. So for Hikaru, it's about just trying to create some sort of challenges, and that's what he's doing. He's going for the queenside pawns. A B2 is going to be lost, and it's not about pawn quantity. I mean, that's not the only thing that matters. The piece quality is the more important element of this position. That's why Hikaru didn't even take the pawn. He understood that his knight would have actually been trapped on B2. You see, the knight has nowhere back to go. So the rook has to stay in the last rank, otherwise there's a checkmate that gives white a free hand on the king side or in the center of the board just to trap that knight and go ahead and win at least a pawn and maybe more. Yeah, and now uh, again, Magnus has that luxury of the move. Okay, he brings his rook to the seventh rank, as Robert points out. This pawn is the first target. It's going to be the first one that drops. At some point, Magnus will happily just activate his king. The knight will always be trapped if it ever gets greedy. And wow, Hikaru decides to go for it. I think there were no better options. This knight now stuck in no man's land. And even if you don't trap it, just go on the attack. There we go, Magnus Carlsen tying down. Look how passive these pieces are. Now he can reroute his knight into this juicy f6 square and the king is going to be stuck in the corner as a bystander for the rest of the game. Looking winning now for white, despite the fact it is level material. And uh, yeah, Magnus, how smoothly is he going to try and convert this one? He's still got some threats that he needs to take care of. Hikaru does have some tricks up his sleeve. We see the position that we have as you were analyzing. You called it out, David. He's moved the rook back. It looks really passive, but he has a trick of jumping back with the knight. And you bring it back into the game, you hit both pawns, the A3 pawn and the central pawn. All these activity, these mating ideas that we're discussing for Magnus right now really rely on that E5 pawn, which is why we see Magnus's last move. He comes back with the rook to take away that key square for the knight. Knight, and Hikaru shifting back to the open file, again threatening the knight jump from b2 to c4. Okay, some tricks, at least some hope of salvation if you get your knight back into the game. I'm wondering now how Magnus proceeds. Uh, you're right, Tanya, actually, not as easy as uh, it looks at first glance. It still feels like it must be winning somehow, but some work to be done. Yeah, I feel like if the A pawns are traded, that may allow Hikaru to breathe a slight sigh of relief. But the problem is that black will still be passively tied down to the defense. And at some point, white will be able to crash through with pawn pushes on the king side. So if the G pawn goes up and the F pawn goes up two squares, with a rook on the seventh rank, there will be devastation for the black king. So it's not ideal to trade off the A pawns. Of course, Max wanted to win the A4 pawn for free. And he may be able to do just that. But even if those pawns are traded, I still 
still think he has great winning chances because Black can hardly move. Yep, he's so slippery. Hikaru, I, I've seen him defend so, so many bad positions over the course of his career. It's probably what he's best at, as he mentioned yesterday in the interview himself. But uh, here, Magnus, it's going to feel like a huge missed opportunity if he doesn't convert it. And uh, he, now, suddenly only one minute difference. Yeah. Suddenly things not so easy. Magnus maybe doubting himself for the first time this game. Hikaru doing a great job of defending. We have to praise his defensive skills. Yes, the evaluation bar says it's dead lost, but he's causing some practical problems. He's not making it straightforward. The winning moves are likely less obvious now for a human. A hundred percent. Hikaru's resilience is from another universe, is what it feels like. And Magnus is thinking more and more. He's got about a minute on his clock. Hikaru, 30 seconds. This is not going to be as easy as we thought, by the way. Yeah, I mean, look at Hikaru's face. He is determined, and I believe the moves are going to happen fast because uh, this pawn on F7 is what Magnus will have to go for. And Hikaru, you see, rook F4, here come the moves. Here they are all going. And the white king goes up. Well, look at Hikaru go. He's just chasing the king around, trying to force it to a, a suboptimal square. But the F7 pawn, the end of the day, that still remains a target. And Hikaru down to just 11 seconds. And only three seconds increment, remember. It's getting dramatic already in game one. It's getting very dramatic, and it feels like Magnus's winning plan here is to just dodge the checks at any cost. Maybe drop your king back to d2, kick that black rook away, prevent the checks. Yes, you allow black to gobble up your queen side, but you're going for the black king. Just tunnel vision is all that's required right now. Go for that black king, and it should be the end. And he's going for it. Hikaru drops back. Very clever defensive move yet again. What a champion he is, uh, holding on here for dear life. Nihilistic in the Twitch chat saying, Psyduck versus Hikachu. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that applause. Nice. That is amazing. And, uh, okay, he's shifting focus now. White's Rook threatening to deliver a nasty check, a mating threat there on the back rank, which Hikaru blocks yet again. It feels like Magnus is throwing everything at Hikaru, but Hikaru is always swatting it away. He always has an answer. And suddenly the Black Knight is threatening two pawns simultaneously. Magnus takes one, but... Okay, it does feel like Hikaru's slightly closer to saving this game now, especially if he can go and capture that white H pawn, that yeah. thorn in his side. What and it's heading there. That's exactly what he does. He moves that knight, attacking that H pawn, but you can pick up the F7 pawn currently. Mm -hmm. Because if you pick it up with the knight, then you don't win that H6 pawn. So White does have that option. Magnus goes for it, picking up a pawn, defending his own, and I'm expecting Hikaru to move the rook Whoa. along the F file. And what, what, do, what happened? No, this game is second. still going. Yeah, he still had enough time, or barely enough time. Oof. And that's the problem, is the knight is kicked out. So the white knight defends the pawn. The black knight can't stay there forever. And don't forget that White has this pass pawn on the queen side, that A3 pawn still exists. You're going to start pushing that one up the board and threatening the black king with checkmating ideas. Yeah. Hikaru looks very unhappy with his position, shaking his head there. He looked ready to resign. He nearly got out of his chair a moment ago. Now, Magnus has to be slightly careful where he puts the king. You don't want to put the king on a passive square. There we go. Out into the open, out towards safety. And I think uh, Hikaru, body language, he's ready to resign. The white king's just going to attack these pieces. And now the black king is the one that is doomed. Checkmate is coming. Black's king all alone. And Hikaru does eventually throw in the towel. Wow. Magnus Carlsen strikes first in the grand final. He takes the lead, winning game one with the white pieces. That means Hikaru Nakamura will have to make a comeback at some point and take this to a grand final. Magnus looking over this. No smile on his face, but a good game by the world. Number one who takes the lead with the white pieces. They now have five minutes before game two where Hikaru will have the white pieces. Ooh, what do you think about Magnus's play here, Robert? I'm not surprised because in the first match between these two, even though they were drawing all their games, Magnus did have the upper hand. He had winning advantage. He called some of his mistakes or his misses inexcusable. Mm -hmm. So Magnus is just playing the same chess he did uh, the other day, but he's a little bit more accurate this time around. He earned that full point. Mm -hmm. Take us through this uh, win for Magnus, David. Yeah, and I just want to show how Magnus clinched it in the end and why Hikaru resigned and uh, why he was so annoyed at himself because he actually fought back into this game very well, Hikaru. Defended against all the threats, fought off the uh, strongest parts of the attack, and just when it looked like he'd survived the worst, he let it slip again. 
mostly influenced by the clock. And here, I think if Hikaru had more time, he would have played a defensive move, sliding the rook back where it had just come from, holding on to this key f7 square. Next move, the black knight is threatening to come and take this thorn in his side, this really annoying white pawn. Instead, however, Hikaru panicked, and we saw him laugh on the camera. He moved his knight to g4, perhaps forgetting that this pawn could simply be captured by the white knight defending this vital pawn. And uh, he tried to create some counterplay here, Hikaru, who tried to annoy the white king by giving some checks, but the white king simply stepped up the board. And uh, here in this position, we saw Hikaru resign. He gave a check, didn't even wait for Magnus Carlsen's reply because the white king would step up the board, any safe square, and checkmate is coming. The black king all alone is not going to be able to defend. And uh, Hikaru, unfortunately, lost that one, but he's, he now needs to fight back. He's still got white in the next game. It doesn't look like much, but neither would a Sicilian defense to the untrained eye. This is a performance enhancer. You don't see it. How about now? Manage your air quality, sharpen your performance, change the game with air things. And you can win an AirThings uh, device today. Remember our viewer competition. You can tweet your answer using the hashtag ChessChamps. The question is, what do you think will be the winning bid in a potential Armageddon? And uh, remember, you can uh, also today get $100 off an AirThings device using the QR code on the bottom of the screen. We're going to take a quick uh, Twitch break. And for everyone else who are subscribers, we're going to re reveal the puzzle of today. There's also another grand final going on today in Division 2. Fabiano Caruana against Yu Yang Yi. What's happening? Okay, I see a point yeah, for Fabiano. This just happened a second ago. Wow. I mean, Fabiano is playing practically perfect, I have to say. You know, it was a great positional masterclass from him with the white pieces. So now the ball is in Yu Yang Yi's court. Yep. So, like Magnus Carlsen, Fabiano Caruana has taken the lead. Yovanka. Puzzles, we love them. And today you told me you have one of your favorite puzzles with you for the viewers. Yeah, I mean, this is a study by Yuri Dorogov. Drog 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 I'll get the name right. <laughs> and it's actually my favorite study ever. Wow. I, I love it. And uh, here you see it on the board. It is white to play and win. And uh, a lot of pieces. A lot one. of pieces, a lot of possibilities. But the final solution is so perfect. It's just beautiful and uh, it's pretty forcing so you're looking at all those checks captures threats and when you see the solution again share that answer with your friends just share it with everyone you know yeah. because this is remarkable and it's such a fun thing to do on a friday right gather your friends family and solve this cool puzzle no no hints from you yet no i'm not going to give any hints okay because it's I feel that this puzzle is so good, you actually need to work it out for yourself. And remember, white to play and win and enjoy solving. Enjoy solving. And I sneak back <laughs> into the studio where we looked at the great puzzle. Because game two is about to start between Hikaru Nakamura and Magnus Carlsen. Hikaru now with the white pieces. He will have to make a comeback at some point after losing the first one. So what should we expect from Hikaru in game two, Tanya? That's a big blow, what just happened in game one. And we were talking about what Magnus did, right? But I think that was more about what Hikaru did on the board. With the black pieces, of course, he had to have the approach of trying to, again, just make the most of each and every game. But he just took so much risk. And now he's a game down. With the white pieces, no draw in this one. If Hikaru doesn't win, the match is over. Mm. Yes, uh, Mag there's still a mathematical chance for it, but it will be way too difficult. Uh, Kaya, it all comes down to this game too. Hikaru has to win. Yeah. Is Hikaru usually mentally strong in situations like this when he has to make a comeback when he's fallen in the first game? Yeah, he's fully capable of bouncing back. In fact, what qualified him for the Candace is he lost an early game in one of the Grand Prix tournaments to Levon Aronian. Then he went on a winning streak and was able to secure his place in the Candace tournament that decided who would play for the World Championship title. So Hikaru can do it, but the problem is he hasn't really played a game with the white pieces. Every time he gets white, it seems like he forces a quick draw. Mm -hmm. So what he has in store is a big question mark for me. But that's the thing. He cannot do that now. He will have to win a game now, David. 
Yeah, he'll have to win, and most likely with white. Magnus very loses when he has white, so Hikaru in game three, if he doesn't win this one, will be suffering. But uh, yeah, it does feel like, as Tanya said, this game is key. He needs to get that self-belief. He needs to remind himself that he can take down Magnus Carlsen. He's certainly capable, but uh, can he do it? Now, he needs to play quicker. That's my main advice to him. Uh -huh. That last game, he was too slow, and the clock cost him. Even though he was suffering in the position, he held it together, but the clock was uh, the deciding factor. Uh -huh. And Magnus Carlsen with the black pieces, what should we expect from him in this game? Now he only needs those draws and uh, he will be the winner of the tournament. His only loss here was with the white pieces to Arjun Aragaisi, so nobody has beaten Magnus when he's had black. He's been ultra solid. I think we'll see more of the same. He needs to force Hikar to beat him. He does not want to beat himself. Mm -hmm. Tense uh, second game coming up very shortly, Hikaru, with uh, the white pieces. And when they only have five minutes, what do you expect they do in between these games, Tanya? I, I think for Hikaru, it's just trying to forget what's happened. We didn't really see him hang around. He just left immediately after losing that game. Uh, just sort of uh, calming yourself down and up-talking yourself. Magnus, we saw him in his seat, probably just checking, going over what he's expecting from Hikaru. One thing's for sure. He can't do what he did in their last matchup two days ago. Hikaru had this martial position where he could have taken his chances, continued playing, but instead just repeated moves. If he gets an opportunity like that, he can't afford to do that. And that's why we don't see a 1E4. So no Berlin draws, no martial opportunities for um, Magnus. And Hikaru here starts, well, with a close strategic opening, which just means we're going to get a game, no big theoretical battles. Yep. I love it. And uh, the chess gods, we know they hate players who take draw quick draws with white, especially. So I'm really glad to see Hikaru go for it in this game, playing the Reti, one of my, my favorite openings. So flexible, all the pieces on the board for a long time, quite likely. And uh, Magnus now looking off to the side, snacking up. The other day he, lo he said he loves to snack during <laughs> the games, between the games. And uh, now just choosing What do you think variation. he's eating right now? Uh, maybe some nuts. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, something... Uh, yeah, Good for the brain, yeah. Something yeah. nutritious. Last season sure. on the tour, we saw him eat noodles yeah, all the time. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Noodle chess. Yes. This opening, the funny thing about it, Kaya, though, is that, you know, we're happy that we have a Reti, but it's also one of Magnus' preferred choices with the white pieces. We very often see Magnus go for this. Robert, what do you think about that? Hikaru choosing a line? that Magnus himself plays so many times. I think you have no choice because these top players play everything under the sun. And Magnus does love this as an opening weapon from the white side, uh, but it's a good choice because you don't bring the battle immediately and that could leave some long-term winning chances. I do think that Hikaru needs to press in this game. He can't just rely on a draw here and hope that he'll survive because he still will need a victory over Magnus Carlsen. So what are the ideas in this position? You've had no pawn tension, no trades just yet. At some point, you are going to strike in the center and create some opportunities to trade off pieces, whether it's the C pawn or the E pawn. So Hikaru has a wealth of experience himself. He's just trying to figure out what direction he wants his game to go. And I think he can push his C pawn and make it an English type of position. I think that means it's a less balanced. It's not going to be symmetrical. And I think that's exactly what Hikaru has to aim for. Yeah, the only possible problem that I foresee with this one, Robert, is that the queens might come off. Uh, uh, okay, he has gone for this, and uh, I'm expecting Magnus to take this pawn, and now if Magnus is happy with the draw, then uh, he would be uh, quite likely to head into the endgame. Magnus is very principled. He won't necessarily go for the most solid approach. He'll go for an approach that he enjoys playing. This is not necessarily a draw, of course. Once the queens disappear, still plenty of pieces left on the board, plenty of life left, but uh, as far as I know, this one has a decent reputation for black. Uh, black is very solid. You can uh, bring the knight out, bring the bishop out. Uh, sometimes you can push forward this pawn. I'm not sure whether this is exactly that type of position to gain a bit more space, but either way, uh, Magnus will be looking for a safe mm -hmm. approach. Another one would simply be to develop the knight, defend this pawn, and uh, play almost a Sicilian, but just with reverse colors. Magnus looking away now, deciding what move mm -hmm. he prefers in this position. Well, according to the math situation, it would make so much sense to trade it off and pick up the queens, and he goes for an endgame. Uh, perhaps if it was slightly different on the scoreboard, we would have seen that knight developing move that you were talking about. And after deciding to trade, we see a few moves being blitzed off with Magnus now making an aggressive pawn push in the center, asking White the question, where is your knight headed? Uh, because, David, watch out. If you take it to the absolute rim of the board. If you make, if you take it to h4, there's always a chance of it getting trapped. h6, first defend that square and then g5 ideas and then suddenly you don't have a good square for the knight. Of course, uh, you have to watch out because the e4 pawn's hanging, but you don't want to put your knight on h4. So perhaps Hikaru has to retreat the knight all the way back. 
Yeah, and that wouldn't be uh, something he enjoys doing either, retreating the knight. It does take a while to, for this knight to get back on a better circuit. And uh, Hikaru, I'm surprised he played this variation without having an answer prepared right now. I've got to say, it feels like he's freestyling, and freestyling against Magnus can backfire. Uh, so, yeah, either this move or maybe bringing it forward. Mm. Uh, I'm expecting one of those two. And the game will go on. Magnus, most likely, after one of these moves, is going to back up his pawn center, connect four right now with, these, uh, with this nice pawn chain. And, uh, yeah, still some chances. Magnus looks like he's loving life, though, smiling to himself. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, he's looking quite amused and happy with what's happening. I wonder what's going on there. Yeah, just... Uh, happy with life? Yeah, happy, yeah, with something, clearly. <laughs> what's uh, happening? Just loving the air out there in Canada. I have no idea, but of course he's happy about the match result thus far. He's up a full point, and with Black, he seems to have no problems out of the opening. Is Hikaru Nakamura on the clock? Uh, David was just mentioning we could see a connect four of those pawns, and Hikaru actually brings his knight all the way back. So Magnus has had no struggles against Hikaru over the board. He's uh, maybe had a worse position for two moves total in all the games they played here in the Air Things Masters, so why not smile? He should be yeah. happy. You know what I think he's laughing at? What? I bet it is, because we know Magnus has a strange sense of uh, music style. He lo loves those 90s classics. I, I bet the chess bras has put something on <laughs> the stereo in that house, maybe a song or something like that from the 90s. We need our viewers to send in what they think has happened. Yeah. Uh, what song is Magnus li listening to? What's made him laugh? What's made him chuckle? A bit of a mystery. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he's got an interesting sense of humor as well. So uh, it could be anything, <laughs> knowing Magnus. <laughs> Huh. He's laughing. He's in a good mood. No doubt, uh, Magnus Carlsen, he's in the lead in the grand final here against Hikaru Nakamura. And uh, Hikaru is uh, fighting to make a comeback, winning this game. Yeah, to me, it just feels like the kind of opposite of a position you want in an almost must-win situation. Now, suddenly, if you look at the White Knights, one of them is stuck on the bottom of the board. One, is the, one of them is stuck on the side of the board. Magnus has this perfect pawn structure. He can't I'm, control himself I'm right so now. I'm so distracted. He's, just, he's finding something so amusing right now. And I have no idea what's so funny. I mean, I get it. He's really happy with the position he's got. <laughs> He can't stop laughing. Do you think Hikaru has Magnus's camera up on the screen? I hope not. Ooh. That is the last thing you want to see after losing a game and almost having to win on demand this one. Yeah, and uh, Magnus, after, I think, uh, a battle with himself there, finally fighting off the smile. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, wow. Well, I don't know what's happened. It's a big mystery. And David, he needed to do that. He needed to get a grip because Hikaru did have a huge threat in that position when he developed that night. He wanted to actually step even further on the board with that knight on the queen side. Uh, and we see Magnus's last move stops any further knight jumps. So just making sure that knight stays there. Uh, while Hikaru doing exactly what he did in game one with the white pieces, playing on the queen side here. He moves away from the long diagonal. Notice that bishop on g7 targeting that pawn on b2, uh, which really stopped white's development and flow in the way pieces would have come out. And now I'm expecting him to go one step ahead with that pawn in front of the rook to defend the c4 pawn. Robert. I know that Hikaru Nakamura is the Fisher Random champion, but it feels like he's playing Fisher Random while Magnus is just playing regular chess. I mean, all of White's pieces are scrambled across the board here. Black's pieces on very good squares, harmonious. We have the pawn chain from h7 all the way down to e4 in the center, which blunts that Fianchetto Bishop in front of the White King. And look at Black's Fianchetto Bishop on g7. It stares across the entire diagonal. Everything going right for Magnus Carlsen in this game. I don't know what he was laughing about, but he does have good reason to be happy he has nothing wrong in his position everything every piece on a good square yeah i agree it looks like fisher random gone wrong for hikaru but he is at least trying to break that chain uh, break down that black pawn chain in the center and start with the head and that e4 pawn if he can get rid of that suddenly the white pieces have much more freedom much more life and uh, i think magnus here would be very reluctant to trade off the pawn that has just moved on f3 uh, he'll be looking for cleverer ways to do that. If the, is that a word? Cleverer? More clever ways? Wiser ways? More practical ways? And he brings his knight out. Again, look at Black's pieces. Perfect centralization. The two Black Knights on the square that we tell all beginners to develop them to. Just uh, controlling everything. The two Black Bishops very well poised mm. for the position to become open. And White stragglers there. Especially those two Knights. I don't like the look of them at all. Hikaru is so good at rotating his Knights. 
but uh, he'll, find, he'll find it very difficult to get them to more active posts, at least in the next few turns, while Magnus finally deals with his king, brings the black rooks to the centre. No problems at all for black. It's definitely white who's trying to equalise in this game, mm. but that shouldn't be enough for Hikaru. Not a good start to this one. Not a good start at all. You've got the white pieces. You want those queens on the board. You want to have a dynamic position. But instead, here, you are on the back foot in an endgame. And you can just aesthetically see and tell that white's position lacks so much space. Black has advanced those pawns. The pieces are out. Now looking at connecting the rooks. For Magnus, the play just seems very easy. I'm trying to figure out what it is that Hikaru can play for in this position. And the one thing that comes to mind is this connect four that you're talking about, uh, David, with the pawns in the center. They have created some dark squared weaknesses. So perhaps Hikaru can look at developing his own bishop to a good active square. Because with this pawn advance, the f4 square has been weakened. The bishop can land there, eyeing another weakness in black's camp. Well, I wouldn't call it a weakness, but at least a pawn that is under attack. Hikaru is dreaming right now and hoping that Magnus trades those central pawns. Because if he does that, then the knight can jump back into the game. The knight hops from e1 to f3, comes to the center of the board, and you're suddenly the bishop on g2 becomes active. And this is the dream position. But Magnus is never, never going to trade uh, these pawns. Yeah, he'll force uh, Hikaru to contort himself and waste several tempi before ever allowing a trade. And remember, we've talked about this in the first game. It's about allowing a trade on your own terms. Magnus, with his last move, said, yes, you can take the, this pawn yourself, but I will simply recapture it. I'm not even sure which way Magnus takes back. You could take with a pawn, still blunting this bishop, still caging, controlling this knight. Or you could take back with your own knight, opening up this beautiful bishop on the long diagonal and uh, saying to black, OK, this is a nice outpost. Uh, sorry, saying to White, this is a nice outpost, and you can only eliminate this knight at the cost of your Fianchettoed bishop. And, uh, okay, Hikaru pushes this pawn forward one square to b3. I don't like it. Yes, it's connect three this time, but uh, <laughs> far less effective than Black's pawn chain, and still some dark square holes on this side of the board. But he needs to do that also, David, to free up his own knight because he had to defend that c4 pawn, the tip of that pawn chain that you were pointing out, so that the knight can reroute itself from c2 to hopefully the center of the board and also control that central d4 square. So it's not a happy move, but a move that had to be made at some point to free up the pieces. And I think the reason that Magnus Carlsen is sitting and thinking right now is his king. He can castle kingside. You can't go queenside. You're not allowed to castle through check. And he does not castle. He brings his king up to f7. So he says this is a position. There are a lot of pieces. A queenless middle game. Let's call it that. But my king can be safe and set on f7 and it's closer to the center in the event I trade off the rooks. Yeah, really nice safe square for the king. And uh, there's no chance it's going to come under fire any time in the next few moves. Simply, uh, as Robert says, shifting the rook to the center. Once you contest for the D file, the open file on the board, then all of your pieces are at play and no danger at all. I'm still expecting one of Tanya's ideas there. Either first attacking this uh, loose pawn, the only weak spot in the black camp, the Achilles heel there, or to relocate the white knight. White is solid, we should mention. So although we're kind of uh, waxing lyrical about black's chances, uh, Hikaru still isn't out of it yet in this game, at least not in terms of losing. Uh, but he brings his bishop to the side and Magnus finally does try to fight for this file. Um, I'm going to stick my neck out here and predict a draw just because it feels like Magnus doesn't need to go all out in this game. Uh, but also it feels like black is never really in trouble. But didn't Magnus also not castle in the last game? So two games in a row? True. Sure. Yeah. How nice. rare is that? Well, when you get to 2800 plus, you can break all the rules. Yeah. If you're watching this at home, please cast your king, listen to your coaches, get that king safe. But Magnus' king has never been in any danger. It wasn't about his king just darting to the side of the board and uh, just being secured by the other pieces. He's using his other pieces with great effect. And in this position without queens, his king is safe and sound. And in both these games, we did have a queen trade out of the opening. So very often we are told that in end games, the king has to be used as a piece. Uh, and that's what Magnus has done in this one as well. Get, keeping it centralized, keeping it close to all his forces. It is the best square for the king. You have to connect the rooks. And the idea we were discussing, David, is on the board. Hikaru tries to reroute the knight to a better square in the process. Also controls, takes hold of those uh, very important dark squares on, in the center of the board. But it still feels as if white is so passive right now. Yeah, white's extremely passive. Even if you get uh, kind of give Hikaru two moves here, I don't think he can really make headway into the black position. Uh, I simply don't know what he's trying to do next other than exchange pieces. Yes, you can maybe lessen the pressure because you are so cramped by trading off a set of rooks, maybe even trading off a set of knights if you're given the time. But 
Is that fighting for an advantage with White? It doesn't feel that way. There might be one idea here, is that tension from the F3 pawn to the E4 pawn. Uh, right, right now, Black has two defenders, the pawn on F5 and the knight behind it on F6. They're both protecting that pawn. But if White says, you can have the bishop pair, I will take the material and use that bishop on B2 and takes that knight on F6, then all of a sudden, White may go up a pawn and say, where is your compensation? Maybe you objectively are better, but you're going to have to prove it not so easy in a position with limited material. Yeah, so maybe a threat on the board uh, there, Robert, after bishop takes bishop and capturing a pawn. I must admit, I wasn't even thinking of being greedy here. I'm so attached to my bishops, I have these blind spots that I forget sometimes. But you're right, that was a threat. And therefore, Magnus, not wanting to allow that to happen, he finally did trade. But now, at least after the white knight gets free, again, a possible threat for Hikaru. Ooh. Suddenly, his position looks far more harmonious, far better. And uh, maybe Magnus will have to take a timeout just to block this check, just to cover this square. And, okay... Finally, it does feel like Hikaru has got over uh, his opening problems here and should be able to equalize. Uh, I don't think more than that, but at least he'll be happier than he was. And he's thinking in this position, is he really contemplating taking in any other way? I guess you could take with the pawn just to keep the pawn structure uh, kind of almost symmetrical uh, to try and push this pawn forward next. But it does feel very slow. Uh, I guess the idea here would be to bring the knight this direction. So... Um, Possible plus sides for that move too, but Hikaru needs to play a bit quicker. He needs to at least have a time advantage if he wants to win this game. It is a big question here for White, what you recapture with, and I think Hikaru has made, well, the more human approach here and what seems to me the right choice to bring your pieces out, to try to play for peace activity here. And he is... He has a huge threat on the board. We were talking about how Black needs to stop this, but this is the best position that Hikaru has had all game today. Uh, maybe all day today, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can expect some more trades of the pieces. Again, trying to open up that bishop on g2. That is the key piece in white's position. The king side bishop, the light squared bishop. Right now, stopped. Right now, there's a block on the road on that diagonal with black's knight on c6. I'm also expecting a trade of these two knights, the white knight on the queen side and the black knight on the queen side, to open up the chances for this fan chatter bishop. So there are some technicalities still to be solved for black here. Mm -hmm. What do you think? We've talked about what Hikaru needs. Is Magnus going to be happy to just shut this one down, move on to the next game? Yeah, and get a draw? yeah and there's no doubt in my mind that if he can just swap all the pieces and make a draw, he'll do that. Because with the white pieces, in game one in the winner's final, in game one here in the grand final, Magnus has had an advantage with white. He could not convert in the winner's final. Hikaru played great defense and used Magnus' clock against him. But today, that was a really good display of just complete control over the board. So we see, speaking of control, Control the board, Magnus pushing his rook pawn up, taking away White's lone threat in the position. And if the status quo remains, White's pawn structure is worse than Black's. You have an isolated pawn on E2. Black has two pawn islands. White has three. So we have connected pawns for Black, and that one pawn on E2, that's not a happy piece. And if Black can attack it, it's going to be difficult to defend. Yeah, and uh, Magnus, okay, now not smiling, now frowning mm. slightly for the first time in the game, not looking too happy. Momentum-wise, it is slightly in White's favour. I feel this position is utterly balanced. It's very equal chances for both sides. But, uh, yeah, he definitely will feel like he had control, and he's lost a bit of control. Now it's Hikaru with a free move to try and create some threats. Maybe Tanya will be right, and we'll see one of the knights jump forward just to trade off, open up the two white bishops, which are very well placed on those two longest diagonals. Meanwhile, the air quality is much better in Magnus's uh, room than it was at the beginning of the day. Interesting. I wonder if in the break time, maybe he went to open a window. Uh, but it served him well in game one. He played very, very uh, convincingly there. And, uh, okay, Hikaru, again, needs to speed up. He needs to make a decision. Well, if White doesn't trade off one of the knights, what Magnus wants to do in, in this position is actually jump with his own knight forward at the center of the board and try and trade off these dark squared bishops. And there we have it. Do we have a move? Yep. Hikaru has decided to jump in with the knight. It's so important for him to get the activity of the light squared bishop because the only target in the position for white here are black's queen side pawns. That pawn on b7, notice that if black does trade on d4, pick up that knight, white can jump in, pick it up with his own knight, hit that bishop on e6, also target that pawn on b7. So we see Hikaru here trying to create some chances in a position that currently looks like it doesn't have that much poison, that much venom in it. But 
one gets the feeling that Magnus still needs to be a little careful here. Yeah, he definitely needs to be a little careful here. Um, there are dual threats, as you mentioned, Tanya, this one and this one. You can solve them both with uh, one move, just retreating the bishop. But again, it feels like a step in the wrong direction. The bishop is very, very passive here. You do hold everything together. I do wonder if Hikaru's plot, his plan here, is after knight takes knight to actually capture another way or potentially even flick in a check. I haven't worked out the consequences here, but uh, you could at least think of flicking in a check. The king moves again. Where does it go? Uh, this is a check hitting this pawn. And uh, for example, if we drop back to its start square, now Hikaru could capture this knight with his rook or with his bishop and still something to worry about, at least for Magnus Carlsen. This pawn is loose and this pawn is loose. So both flanks, both sides of the board, you have issues. And uh, if this isn't, if this is a potential hazard for Magnus, then he has to go into the tank now as he's doing because white is adding up the threats, stepping up the pressure. I think he's wisely spending time, as you're saying, because it could be dangerous territory for him. That pawn, Every pawn push creates a weakness in your position, and here is the g6 pawn lost its friend defending it. So knight e5 check will be a big threat in a variety of positions. I do think that white's position is a little bit too loose. Uh, if we just uh, kind of even look at this line, just two steps further, once the king slid back to the square you put it on, and we see a swap of rooks on the d4 square, that bishop on d4 is loose and there's a bishop on g7 so the knight on f6 moves out the way either to g4 or back to d7 and we see that this bishop on d4 is hanging the knight on e5 under attack twice magnus can work his way out of this so he has everything under control for now Mm -hmm. Well, he does. He does pick up the knight. Yeah. So this gives White the opportunity to go for this line, the intermezzo that we're talking about. And I often feel that intermezzos are the easiest moves to miss. Of course, Hikaru hasn't missed the check here. But in general, in chess, we're so tempted towards recapturing immediately. But Hikaru, of course, has found it. He knows that he needs to go in for this attack. Uh, and I really like this line, David, that you were pointing out, hitting that pawn on g6, hitting that pawn on b7, and simply capturing, recapturing the central knight with the bishop. Nice play here by Hikaru out of an opening that I don't think he was super happy about. I don't think he was uh, uh, ecstatic about the position that he got. But he's managed to create some chances. Mm -hmm. An intermesso. What does that mean? We need to translate. Yeah. Uh, there's various different, <laughs> words, uh, different terms. I guess in English, we would say like an intermediate move. Uh -huh. So before playing an automatic recapture, we flick in another move first. Normally, it's a check to gain some time, and only then do we capture. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in that last position, white gave up a knight temporarily and flicked in a check first, black reacts, and now he'll regain the material balance. And that black knight in the center of the board will be taken, will be captured. There's various terms. Intermezzo, I guess, is Italian? And it's, mu it's related to music. Ah, okay, okay, related to music. Ah. But there's also the German word Zwischenzug, like uh, literally between move. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. It's I basically a shocker. Yeah. It's You're it's expecting one thing, but you get something else. Yeah. <laughs> It's uh, normally something you don't want to see if you're on the wrong end of an intermezzo. But uh, here, Magnus reacted very quickly, did bring his king back to a central square, and Robert predicted this whole line, predicted the future. Uh, thanks to the looseness of white's pieces, black can solve his problems tactically. Mm -hmm. That's often what you need to do, and uh, I think Magnus is okay. And because, but, oops, sorry, go ahead. Go. Yeah, because I was, uh, I, there was just uh, such a good pass <laughs> <laughs> saying, yeah, Robert predicted the future. And the question is, has uh, Robert mm. predicted the future? <laughs> if we have Armageddon, we have asked the expert to place their bid in this envelope for what they think uh, the winning bid for time will be if we do see Armageddon today. I have all their predictions in this envelope, and we're also asking you at home the same question. What do you think the winning bid for time will be in Armageddon? You can tweet your answer using hashtag ChessChamps, and one lucky winner will get an AirThings device signed by Magnus Carlsen himself. Mm. I think right now, Hikaru is dreaming and hoping to get that Armageddon in. After that first game loss, yeah. he needs to win one game in this match to just equalize, to just level the score and get into that Armageddon. But of course, that would be a whole different mind game. Yeah. Different strategies. The two have already played one Armageddon, so they kind of know how they think. Magnus called it a soul read, that one second win that he had. I know. Oh. Uh, Tanya, I thought you were going to say he's dreaming of winning this AirThings device. What happens, actually, if Hikaru <laughs> writes in himself, tweets in the exact time he's going to bid? Uh, He'll be the closest. Oh, <laughs> that's a loophole. <laughs> it's a clear loophole. I bet AirThings will be very happy to send uh, an AirThings device to Hikaru. The question is, do you think he would want it Whoa. signed by Magnus? Oh, what's happening? <laughs> okay. uh, actually, nothing that dramatic, but he found a really clever way to oh. trade bishops. Uh, I was expecting the White Knight to retreat, but he found a much more active square. Sorry there, Kaya. Uh, it's just uh, chess players kind of... Uh, Reaction. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> to, <laughs> to a shaka. Exactly. Well, show, it, us, sh show us why this is so beautiful. Um, yeah, now it's died down into a very normal position, <laughs> but uh, he just found an artistic way to do it. That one was for the memes, for the fans uh, from Hikaru. So we were looking at this position. Robert predicted it pretty much. Uh, pressure on this knight and uh, along this diagonal, the white bishop behind it is loose. So this white knight has to defend its bishop. I was expecting just a simple drop back. And uh, after a bishop trade, we reached this position, which actually occurred in the game. But instead, Hikaru played a move that wasn't on my radar. I've got to admit, he jumped out the other way. And it looks like the knight has just sacrificed its own life. Uh, it's committed suicide here, but luckily you're attacking this bishop. So there's no, no time to take this knight. Uh, instead, uh, we saw a trade and back to the same position. But, uh, uh, but Hikaru did it in a more forceful, more artistic mm. way. Huh. That was that was quite a stunner for a moment. And uh, of course, it was White's dream as well to trade off this fan shattered bishop. He's done it. What Black also wants to do is try and pick up that G2 bishop, the White's light square bishop. And uh, the knight, I can imagine it jumping onto E3, hitting that rook on D1, hitting that bishop on G2. Let's say White does come up with the rook to D3, attacking the knight. Black can swap off uh, this uh, monstrous bishop that White has. And I think that's a trade that Magnus is happy about. The more pieces that get traded, Black's king moves forward. We know Magnus loves his king in the center. Connect those rooks. Looks like a happy endgame for Black. Well, whether he's happy or not, he did, in fact, do this. And this is the variation we have on the board. And, well, for Magnus, there's no holes in his position, no weaknesses. That said, a knight can actually outclass a bishop in the ending because the knight can jump from color complex to color complex. It can go from light square to dark, and that bishop has to stay on the light square. So for now, everything under control for Magnus Carlsen, but there could be a future where the knight causes some problems on the dark squares that that black bishop cannot handle. Yeah, maybe uh, at some point trying to jump into this central post, but uh, that's why he, uh, Magnus, sorry, uh, as Tanya predicted, advancing the Black King. The Black King is going to be the guardian of the dark squares while the bishop uh, tries to get active on those light squares. So he's, col he's uh, controlling all those color complexes for now, but uh, Hikaru will be trying to make some headway with his knight, maybe with his rook on the open file. Still some chances. It's still imbalanced enough to win this one for both sides, but objectively, it's very, very level okay. right now. Uh, both ticking down to three minutes on the clock. What do you think, Robert? What will be the result in this game? It's looking to be a likely draw, just because of the limited material, but it depends on Hikaru's mindset. If he really feels like he must push, and I think we've seen that throughout the game. He's kept more pieces on the board, taking some risk in the process, that if he feels this is now or never, he could in fact lose this game. But I, I said, and we were talking about earlier, it feels like Hikaru has to win. Now that we're here, you can't just sacrifice the match. Mm -hmm. That if he draws this game and is able to hold with the black pieces in game three, he still will get that rebuttal, game four, with the white pieces. He doesn't want to sacrifice the entire match right now in what looks like an even end game. Yeah. David, when you're playing a game like this, mm -hmm. how much of the match situation is sneaking into your head? More than it should. Yeah. <laughs> it's so hard to block out what's going on around you. These guys, they're very aware that there's thousands of fans watching out there, cheering for them. Uh, but of course, they're able to perform under those incredible, that uh, kind of incredible amount of pressure. For myself, I struggle, especially when I know there's so much on the line. There's a huge title, there's money, there's uh, everything uh, at stake. Mm. Uh, yeah, I really have in my past, uh, in, throughout my career, uh, kind of struggled to put that to one side. But uh, these guys are good at that and um, they will find a way to focus, especially for Hikaru, I feel. For Magnus, it's maybe easier to drift because he's a point up. He knows he's done half of the hard work. For Hikaru, he is so focused on the fact he needs to win, so everything else will be blocked out just uh, for this game or two. Meanwhile, Magnus throwing a pawn forward. He's opened up his bishop. Uh, that black bishop is now like, uh, like an arrow darting down towards that white h3 pawn on the light square. Actually, there's multiple tactics in the position. Um, just to show one idea off here, um, if Hikaru is careless, I'm not sure whether it works, to be honest, but uh, if pawn takes pawn right now and captures this pawn, Black does have the option of taking this guy with his rook, luring the white king out onto a light square, a rook sacrifice, but you win back the piece immediately with a nice skewer. The king moves out the way and we capture this rook. And this is not necessarily winning for Black. It's not a winning tactic, but it's just a nice way to keep things simple. And actually, a bishop often outclasses a knight with pawns on both sides of the board. Actually, today, this morning, I was annotating a game by our friend Simon Williams, a ginger GM, oh. where in the play-ins for this tournament, he won a very nice endgame with bishop for knight uh, because there were pawns on both sides of the board racing and the bishop with its long range uh, is the superior piece. So uh, really clever tactic from Magnus Carlsen. Dual threats now or triple threats of uh, taking this pawn, taking this pawn with this bishop, but also capturing this pawn with this rook. 
How does Hikaru fight against this? Things are getting more and more difficult for Hikaru now. This last move of Magnus, some serious questions, and Hikaru's got about two minutes to answer. The line that you were pointing out makes one really not want to take on F4 and create all these weaknesses, the weak pawns on the king side. But the other option is equally unpleasant. If you push that pawn, the G pawn up to G4, trying to take away that key F5 square from the bishop, Black can also advance his own G pawn one step ahead. And now notice this F4 pawn. It's such a big strength in Black's position. We call this a protected past pawn. One of White's pieces is forever going to be left to stop this pawn from getting further down the board. And it's a huge strength in, White's, in, in Black's position. This is a nightmare to deal with. Yeah, and Hikaru right now just weighing up his options. Is he going to capture this pawn? Yes, but now his winning chances will disappear. And your move's on the board, David. Immediate blow from Magnus Carlsen. He had the time to calculate it. He's a minute up on the clock. And here, again, Hikaru, what do you do? You have so many weaknesses, this pawn under threat. Maybe you just take this rook and go down into the end game where it should be a draw, but you have to be careful with white. Yeah, and he could slide his rook over instead of taking the rook all the way to the g1 square attacking g6. But the black rook says, well, I can do the same. Slide right back to d6. And this pawn structure is better for black. We see that Hikaru actually decides to strike with the move pawn to b4. And I get the sense that he is playing for a win now. It will likely backfire. He's going to have a worse position. Black can just take this pawn on b4. And then look at this. It's like bowling when you have a split. All of white's pawns all over the place. Black's pawns are next to each other. Much easier to defend, whereas White's pawns are really an ugly uh, sight to see. Yeah, that's an eyesore for sure. And uh, Magnus goes for a different option. He actually went for this A-pawn immediately, but still, the same point remains. These are ugly pawns. These are ugly pawns. Advantage black right now. And throughout the event, we've spoken about just how helpless the knights feel against a rook past pawn. And Take a look at that A pawn that uh, Magnus has currently. Once it starts racing down the board, White's Knight is going to find it so difficult to defend it. Robert, you were talking about a Ooh, bad... Oh my God, we have a, a repetition. Are we going to get a draw? It's up to Magnus now. Hikaru leans back. He was shaking his head there. It's at Magnus's disposal if he keeps checking and it keeps pinning with the Black Rook. The White King has to keep running out of that Rook's eye line. Do you think he's going to go for it? But he knows he's better here. And that is so tempting to play on because Magnus with his Magnus touch about end games, but also the math situation, uh, David, is playing in his mind. He knows if he draws, he gets a White in the next game. He gets closer to that championship. But he can play on here. Magnus. I think he's going to play on. Did you see Hikaru as well? Looked so unhappy, super unhappy for a few moments there, just bobbing his head. He was like, come on, give me the draw, give me the draw. Let's yeah. move on to the next one. But Magnus is teasing him now, not making a decision yet, not making a move. Hikaru is really hoping for it. And Magnus goes for it. We've got a game on our hands. Wow. He's going for the win, Magnus Carlsen. And activating the Black King. Oof, this one it looks so good visually for Black. So I don't blame him at all, Magnus, for going for this. But Hikaru needs to recompose himself now. To defend. And Magnus probably estimates his losing chances nearing zero. So even if he won't win this game, he should not lose. But look at Hikaru go. He brings his knight forward. Next will be his rook up in the king's line. Rook b6 check across the sixth rank. That b7 pawn is a bit tender. And watch out if Hikaru can push his c5 pawn. Those are double and isolated. We're talking about them being eyesores. He can eliminate his own pawns off for a trade and then maybe go after this black bishop. So a good chance for Hikaru Nakamura just to create some chaos. But but ultimately, Magnus Carlsen has everything under control like he usually does. Yeah, and uh, I love this attitude. Just always activity over anything. That's the motto of the top chess players in the world. Now he's trading off those pawns again. Robert predicting the future. And look at this black bishop. Doesn't have too many safe squares. He finds one Magnus and Hikaru shaking his head yet again. Surely that rook is going to go and grab that black A pawn before it starts running, before it starts making a dart towards promotion and level material. Two pawns against two pawns. Still no winning, no losing chances, sorry, for Magnus Carlsen. But can he press it for the win? Hikaru, he's just furious at himself, but he needs to knuckle down and at least make a draw in this one, at least make it close in this match. And we're going to see, we're going to see him give checks and Magnus falls back. Does he have to go for a repetition now? Because I don't see where you're hiding with your king unless you march all the way to the queen side. Mm -hmm. I think Hikaru should be really grateful that he has a draw here. He looks really devastated, but just give the draw, move on to the next one. Still two games to uh, catch up to get that win. This one hasn't been his best effort, but he's done enough to secure a draw, a fair result in the end. And I think we're going to see it, Robert.
Yeah, uh-huh. there's no choice. I mean, what can white do besides give the checks? Your pawn C4 is loose. If you try to play for win, that outside pawn, the black rook pawn, will go up the board. So we see the check back and forth. The game is a draw. And that's a fair result, I think. Hikaru did not have winning chances throughout. And Magnus Carlsen, when he had a moment to try for a win, he said, I'll try a little bit, but I'm not going to go all in. There's no point. He runs off Hikaru Nakamura with the white pieces. He did not get the win he needs in this game. Magnus Carlsen is still in the lead after two out of four games here in the grand final. Looking over the position, Magnus and uh, Hikaru, how will he be feeling right now, Tanya? Magnus is happy. I think both games, he's the one, the only player who had any chances. He's played the match flawlessly so far. Hikaru, of course, taking super, super duper risks, but they have backfired in round one. In round two, with the white pieces, he didn't get anything with white. Hikaru is not happy right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, The next game, he starts with black. If Magnus wins the next one, the tournament is over. Magnus will be the champion. Hikaru needs to make sure with the black pieces, he remains in control. Don't give advantage Magnus out of the opening. Yeah. Is there anything in this game we should look over, David? Uh, Maybe we can just recap towards the closing stages where Magnus locked it down and took all risk out of the position. And uh, we mentioned that Hikaru didn't get off to the best start, but he had been turning the game around. He had now created small imbalances. There's this knight for bishop imbalance. And also in terms of the pawn structure, there's four versus three on the queen side for white. So something to cling on to, something to get hopeful about. But Magnus now with these next two classy moves, First, throwing a pawn on the fire, and then Rook takes pawn. He locked it down. He said to Hikaru, you're never winning this game. This does rely on a tactic that uh, King takes Rook is met by this nasty skewer, picking up the white Rook next, and the white uh, Knight will struggle to fight against the black Bishop. Hikaru instead trying to go for it, as Robert said, trying to create winning chances still. But uh, here, Magnus just shut things down by going for the white pawns, and white's pawn structure here was too ugly. No winning chances. A really nice sequence there just to uh, simplify the equation and make things simple for Magnus. Little less than 10 minutes uh, before Game 3 starts. Magnus Carlsen will have the white pieces. If he wins that game, he will be the winner of the Air Things Masters. And yesterday, our friends at Air Things and Meetup, they organized a uh, watch party at the Good Night here in Oslo. And uh, Air Things uh, is what it's all about. In this tournament, you can win a signed Air Things device by Magnus Carlsen. Today, we are asking everyone to place your bet for what the lowest bid will be in case of Armageddon. And you can uh, place your bet using the hashtag ChessChamps on Twitter. One lucky winner will get uh, a signed Air Things device. And uh, remember, today you can get $100 off an Air Things device. Just uh, use your phone, scan this QR code, and uh, go grab your Air Things device. Right now, we're going to take a quick Twitch break. If you're not a subscriber, but if you are a subscriber, Well, let's hang out here in the studio. Action is uh, happening on this very final day of the Air Things Masters. Magnus Carlsen still in the lead in the grand final in Division 1. How about Division 2, Jovanka? Is uh, Fabiano still in the lead there? Yeah, he's still in the lead, but it doesn't look like it will continue because it's been a very topsy-turvy game. And it looks like Yu Yang Yi is actually going to take the second game. Okay. So if... Oh, uh, we're having some troubles with your microphone, Yu Yang I need to turn it on. And uh, so if uh, Yu Yang Yi wins the second game, he ties the match. He has to uh, win this first uh, match in the grand final to take it to a reset. And right now, yes, I can see on the bar, it's looking good for Yu Yang Yi to make that. Uh, come back. All right, Yvanka, we also have the puzzle today. One of your favorite puzzles of all time. Let's remind the viewers what it's all about today. Yeah, it's such a fantastic puzzle with lots of, uh, well, one big resource in the position. Now, it looks like a quite complicated position after all. Black does have two queens, but uh, take a look at the Black King. It's in danger, and that's why it's white to play and win. And I have to say, 
when you find the solution, it is so beautiful. It's the kind that you actually just want to share on social media, at your meetup, in the studio, and you just want to go running. And I have to say, I was first saw it like in 2010, and it just captured my imagination ever since. Oh. What is it that you like so much about it? <laughs> it's got a, such aesthetic value. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have to admit, when I first saw it, I didn't catch who composed it. And so I was haunted by this. And I was asking everyone, did you see this puzzle? Do you know of a puzzle where it ends like this? And they went, no. <laughs> and then I saw it in Judith Polgo's book. And I was like, yep, got it. All right. And uh, there we go. Oh, yep. On uh, the screens behind us, we see there is a result that uh, Yu Yangi has tied the match, incredible stuff. So now game three and four coming up. What do you think? What, what do you expect from the rest of this match? Well, Fabi does have the white pieces and he did prove in the first game that he was very, very powerful. He, he came very well prepared and he just looked like he was in full control. And Yu Yang Yi, when he struck back with the white pieces, I mean, again, it looked like the opposite, you know, like he was in complete control as well. So it's gonna be a very fun, tight battle, I think. And uh, Fabiano, obviously playing from, uh, for the US, uh, but I hear rumors he's actually sitting in Spain during the Air Things Masters and Yu Yagi in China. It's super late for him playing this final. <laughs> yeah, but they do say that chess players are night owls. So I hopefully, you know, this time isn't actually going to affect his performance. It hasn't so far. You know, he's been very impressive. He's a creative player. And uh, well, I can't wait to see what lies ahead. Yeah. All right, uh, you guys, if you followed our show yesterday, you might have heard that we talked about Harry Potter and Wizard's Chess. And in the first book, there is uh, a scene where, uh, where there is a game of uh, Wizard's Chess going on, leading into the Philosopher's uh, Stone. Most people will not be able to remember the moves in that game. But this is what happened when uh, David Howell tested Magnus Carlsen's memory. I'm now going to be showing Magnus some historical chess positions. Let's see if he recognizes them. This position, I bet it looks familiar. Uh, yeah, uh, this looks an awful lot like uh, Tal Botvinnik. I think the continuation here was probably Queen d5 and then Rook a6 and uh, Tal, Tal 1. Yes. Fourth game from Seville, obviously. <laughs> you got that right. Should I go on to the next one? <laughs> I was literally reading about this. Like, this is the book that is on my bedside table about the Kasparov Karpov matches. Does this ring any bells? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the old making one uh, that Tricky, Tricky missed. So this is Anand Ivanchuk from one of the uh, Intel Rapid tournaments, probably from like 95 or something. Uh, 94, I think. But 94, yeah. Yeah, you're completely correct. Now I'm going to play through an opening and stop me when you recognize the game. And if you can tell me who was playing black in this one. Okay. Sure. okay. I'm sure you've seen this opening before. Okay, it's gonna be Anand. <laughs> Against? Zabata. <laughs> what year? Uh, 87, 88 maybe? 88? 88. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know what <laughs> Okay, good one. Uh, so this is like top three worst chess memories that I have. This is the game Carlson Howell from World Youth Ch Championship 2002. Uh, I ne needed to win the um, last game. I was half a point in front of Jan Nepomnici. The most annoying part uh, I remember about that last round is that Jan Nepomnici was playing against um, an Indonesian player, Susilu Dinata. 
I think he played a Karu Khan as black. He had an extra pawn and, and, and a great position and then he just collapsed. And I was losing my advantage as well and I just remember just raging like crazy. Uh, I could but, tell, yeah. uh, Obviously it got David a bronze medal, so that's that's the good part. Uh, it's all downhill from there. <laughs> wow, 19 years ago and you still remember the game next to you. I mean, this could have been some booth game where I played or something. <laughs> That's a good guess. That's a good guess. I'm probably gonna need a hint. Okay, it's from uh, the entertainment industry. It's uh, okay. So black is down a queen. So from the first Harry Potter movie, they played the Scandinavian, and then they went knight c3, queen c6. So is it from from that one? Well done. Thank well, you. Okay. Was, okay. Needed, that's need, that's needed, impressive. Needed thing. some serious hints, but... Yeah, um, but it still could have been anything after the entertainment industry. A good one, though. Good okay. one, though. Good one. Still blows my mind. Magnus had no hints. David just put the pieces on the board. What's your reaction, Tanya? What is that brain? How does he do this? Yeah. It is just something I've never seen before. I mean, the guy remembers being 11, what was happening on the board next to him, yeah. not just his games, what players have played, the tournament that they played in, and that Harry Potter movie, how he said the queens are not on the board, it was a Scandinavian. Yeah. How does he do this? I mean, I'm just mind blown. I can't believe it. I'm just proud of him. He's forgiven David, so that's the biggest accomplishment of all. <laughs> he started talking to me like seven years later <laughs> after that game. Yeah. Incredible mind on uh, Magnus Carlsen. His memory is just mind blown and he could be about to win the very first event in uh, the Champions Chess Tour 2023. If he wins this game, he will be the winner of the Air Things Masters. Hikaru Nakamura, he cannot lose and he has to win either this one or the next one to take it to Armageddon. And we have the first move on the board in game three. Yeah, it's the King's Pawn opening, 1e4 and Hikaru. Is he just posing? It looks like his blue steel right now. Like, does he know the game has started? <laughs> Uh, or is he just genuinely thinking about his first move? He's 100% thinking about the opening approach here because it's really with the black pieces. Under normal situations, you'd be happy to just draw and get up and leave. Hikaru wants to keep the game going. He needs to understand, does he rely on that fourth game Whoa. only with the white pieces? He'll have one chance and he says, no, I'm also going to maximize my chances with the black pieces. Doesn't go for a potential Berlin or a potential uh, quick draw with the king pawn moves, but starts with the Sicilian, making his intentions clear. In the middle game, I want attacking chess with the black pieces. But Tanya, it cost him almost one minute to play one move, his first move. Surely, he had a 10-minute break. He should have been coming up with an opening strategy. We have the night off. I love it. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Unless Magnus gives a check right now, which he mm. has done in World Championship matches where he only needs a draw. Um, thinking back to his match against Anand, he needed a draw with White. He locked things down. No open Sicilian. I played that opening uh, my whole life, but I think that what Hikaru Nakamura is trying to do is tempt Magnus Carlsen. Be provocative. Say, let's play an aggressive game. It's a Sicilian. You want to clash. You love chess just like I do. But the match situation calls for Magnus Carlsen to score one point. If he draws the next two games, he is the champion of the Air Things Masters. Bishop b5 check is ultra solid. He plays it. That's what we were expecting. I think that Hikaru knows that Magnus wants to avoid any of the tactical sequences. So I think a good choice from yeah. Magnus Carlsen. I'm sad. Mm -hmm. I was really hoping for that d4 central break. Give me the night off. But instead, of course, uh, Magnus goes for the solid Rosalimo opening. Uh, one that was made super popular in the 2018 World Championship match between Magnus and Fabiano Caruana. Yeah, and uh, I haven't seen Hikaru play this reply to that bishop check before. I must admit, normally he blocks with a piece uh, in a different way earlier. But now white is the first to castle. White is already occupying the center. And watch out for Magnus. Just drop back his light square bishop at some point and then start pushing pawns uh, to control some squares. Hikaru needs to get his skates on right now and develop his pieces, his king side pieces. There we go, starting with the knight. But uh, still theoretical position, of course. And uh, it's just up to uh, Hikaru now to create some imbalance if he, or create some uh, something, at least, for Magnus to think about. Uh, I'm not that optimistic for Black, to be honest, here, because Magnus, he's the leading expert in these uh, types of structures, this exact opening. Uh, he, it's going to take her a lot to, just to surprise him, let alone find something that's actually mm. objectively uh, 
dangerous, still strong. And White can throw the d4 pawn, right? That's always a play in these Sicilians. But instead, because of the way black has developed, White can actually push the c pawn up one square to c3 to reinforce the d4 square. You would like to have multiple pawns in the center. Often in the Sicilian, you only get your e pawn while the d pawn gets traded. But here, if you start with the move c3 right now and then play d4, you're going to be able to recapture with your pawn. And that's the healthy center you want. Two pawns sticking out there, taking control over important squares. The knight on b1 one can leap out to the c3 square as well. That's as healthy as it gets in the center of the board when you're looking at an opening. Yeah, meanwhile, Magnus plays uh, this move first, putting his pawn on h3, just preventing any potential bishop uh, pins later on. And he'll still go for this plan. I think that Robert was suggesting that. He's just trying to finesse it a bit first. But uh, now Hikaru, what is he going to go for? I have seen variations, for example, kicking the bishop back home first and then getting really ambitious. This is a, this, If it was Simon Williams here in the studio, he'd be like, push Gary, push Gary, push the g-pawn, try to go for the white king. But I doubt Hikaru is uh, going to employ that one uh, in this position, in this game. But he might, David. I mean, let's not forget the match situation. And the one thing that always comes to a chess player's mind when your opponent makes this move uh, the pawn push, the rook pawn to h3, where you haven't castled yourself, is how you can break open that g file. It's definitely something that Hikaru is thinking about right now. It's a huge risk to take. He can even move the rook one step and prepare that pawn advance. He could sacrifice it, but the ideas remain the same. Will he go all out or all in, however you want to call it, because there's no turning back if Hikaru takes this decision to advance that g pawn using that h3 move that Magnus has made as a hook in the position to open up the king side. And you can tell he's tempted Hikaru. He's, he's so tempted his right His now. eyes are darting all over the place. And did you see that gesture? He was like, come on, let's go. And uh, surely he's going to push that pawn. Is he? There yeah. we he go, we it. have it. <laughs> Gary the G-pawn makes an appearance. G5, he's going for Magnus' as king. And very famously, Magnus Carlsen lost a game with the white pieces in this kind of opening against Veselin Topalov. Back in the Sinkfield Cup 2015, I was commentating that action, wow, nearly a decade ago. <laughs> hard, for, old, yeah, hard for me to remember these things, but Magnus, he remembers everything. So he has bad memories facing this type of position where black is trying to bust open the king side. The black king, it's nice and safe in the center. We're often taught to castle our king. Things. Here, you see Hikaru. He is looking into this position because he is aiming right for Magnus Carlsen's monarch. And you see Magnus, he needs to think right now. He can capture that pawn, but it may not be worth it. It opens up lines in front of his king. And actually, concretely as well, perhaps it just doesn't work out because imagine you do pick up the pawn and black can shift that rook that we were talking about, the king side rook. Uh, it would then come into play. The open file would be so telling. And we see these two players on the screen. They're so focused right now. Hikaru leaning back. He says, game on, Magnus. Will you take that pawn? If you don't, I'm going to advance it regardless. Opening up that G file. Uh, I love to see it. And uh, you know what they say in chess. You advance a pawn in the flank, the best response to that is open up the center because Black's king is still right there where the game starts and Magnus plays the most logical way to continue. Opens up his bishop, the queenside bishop, and challenges Hikaru in the center, asking him to make a decision. There's no stopping Hikaru. <laughs> he just goes on with Gary the G-pawn. I love it. Well played, Hikaru. You're going for the king now. Uh, no way back from here. You've pretty much gone all in in this game. But uh, this is what you need to do. You need to attack the giants of the game. They hate it. Uh, Magnus wants a game where he can maneuver. He wants an end game that he can control. But uh, going for the king, Magnus is not going to be feel, feeling comfortable no matter how this game ends up. Uh, so I love what Hikaru is doing right now. We have to de delve in and uh, explore uh, the chaos, the fire that's on board already, and it's only move nine. And, um, okay, Hikaru reacts. White steps forward with the pawn, hitting the Black Knight. And will we see a trade? Will we see some pieces come off the board? Magnus wants to at least calm this game down by trading off pieces and uh, at least reaching a position that he knows he has uh, at least some level of safety. But, uh, yeah. We'll uh, delve into those in a moment. Here we go. And Black now has the option of taking this white knight. Uh, I guess his reply will be to take this one. And luckily, no time for Black to continue opening up the white king because this bishop is attacked with check. So uh, I'm expecting a bishop capture, a queen coming out now. And at least without that uh, set of knights on the board, it's going to be slightly easier for white to defend the king. I still feel that Hikaru has some levels of activity, some hopes 
on this king side. But uh, Magnus will be happier here. What do we think? Any alternatives to this line? The fact that he's still thinking leads me to believe that he may not capture the knight f3 because that is the automatic response. If he were playing bullet chess, and we know how good both these players are in those time patrols, you just take the knight f3, give up your knight. He does, in fact, go for it, but I was thinking that uh, Hikaru, he wants to reply instantly at every turn. So when Magnus takes an f3, he wanted his response lined up. He plays his rook over to g8 after this series of trades, and I think Hikaru, he knows that he needs to use the clock to his benefit. He wants to put Magnus in time trouble the issue, though, is now White's king does not feel wide open. There's just one rook staring at the king. There's a bishop, a queen defending that pawn over there, and Black's king remains in the center. It's not going to easily cast the queen side either, so I think that uh, for now, Hikaru is doing just fine, but I don't think that there's any weaknesses in Magnus's camp either. Uh, I completely agree with Robert. You know, we've been talking about this open G file and Hikaru's managed to do that. But this sort of gives me the nightmares from that game one, where with the black pieces, Hikaru just went all out, took too many committal decisions in the opening, only to be backfired and left with more weaknesses. Now, talking about Black's king in the center, it just feels like that's the more vulnerable king. White has got a simple plan. Develop that bishop. Take that bishop out. You can go all the way to F4. Bring that queen side rook to the center of the game. Target that queen. And and then what you're looking for at some opportune moment is that knight jumping to d5 or that pawn from e4 moving up to e5, opening up both the files. And it just looks like, yes, you open the g file, but show me the money, show me the attack. And I'm not finding it for Hikaru. Yeah, I'm not seeing it yet either. It definitely feels like Hikaru needs to take some time out, maybe try to get this king over to safety on the queen side uh, in the near future. But uh, he's in the tank right now. I like what he's done still. But uh, Magnus doing a good job of uh, locking it down. Okay, he needs to speed up Hikaru. And wow, a rook move. A quirky little rook move here. Lifting up, defending his knight. Maybe the idea is to slide the bishop out behind it to this uh, long diagonal. Maybe he's just overprotecting his knight so he can push his pawn forward and take some more control over central squares to try and deter your idea, at least, Tanya. But um, still, it's very tempting to jump in with the white knight now or over the next few moves. Um, I'm starting to think that uh, Magnus here has decent chances if he can keep okay. his nerves in check. If he wins this game, he will win the tournament. What seems to be Magnus's intentions in this game? Is it to just win it? Well, he w he's reacting so far. So he, of course, would like to win it now that we've arrived at this point. But Hikaru said from the, his very first move, I'm not going to allow you to make a draw. And we've said this before, you don't really like to poke the bear. <laughs> now that you're forcing Magnus to play a game, we look at the position, White's king is actually safe and sound over here. So unless Black gets a few turns to get the king castled queenside, bring that second rook into the attack, it feels like White is just first to the action. The Black king still in the center of the board, the White knight able to hop forward into that d5 square, I think that Magnus, you know, his action has been more or less uh, kind of easy for him just because he had no other choices. And for Hikaru, we have to praise him for his mentality, for the fight that he's bringing. But I do think that it's harder for Black to play in a position like this. Yeah, certainly harder for Black to play. But Hikaru, he's so universal. He can, uh, yeah, as long as he has an imbalance or two, he can work his magic there. So uh, now, okay, clock's around level. I don't see why Magnus is hesitating, to be honest. Just bring pieces into the game, as Tanya was advocating. Bring that white dark square bishop out. Bring that white rook in the corner towards the center. Looks very natural. But I think it is just uh, the effect of the Nakamura approach in this game, going for Magnus, not showing any fear, that has forced Magnus to pause, to slow down. He spent two minutes on this move, when it feels like uh, he has a couple of natural alternatives. Mm. So eventually he'll make a decision and... Uh, Hikaru will have his reply ready. Mm -hmm. They're not yet in each other's camps. All the white pieces on one side of the board. Oh, okay, <laughs> well, here we're jumping in. Commentator's curse, Kaya. Yeah. Well, I kind of like that timing. Yeah. Is this Magnus uh, sort of going for Hikaru's king now? He is, uh, especially if this knight is captured. Black can uh, choose which piece to take this knight with. But if the black knight or the black bishop capture this white knight, suddenly it will be replaced by a pawn and the e-file will be open. White's rook on the central file will be staring down the black king and that black king ain't going to be feeling comfortable. So uh, I'm expecting Hikaru to dodge this trade, not uh, at least capture on white's terms. Either you wait or you retreat the black knight. Uh, those feel like the only two options right now. It would be absolutely hideous for Black to take that knight on d5 and open up the e-file with that king still stuck on e8. But he needs to be careful about how he decides not to let that happen. And Hikaru making more committal decisions on the board, more pawn pushes, and instead of developing the pieces here, this can turn bad really quickly. He goes for e5, he's trying to just block the position, but it just feels as if there have to be some tactics here. 
Black king still in the center. Do you just wait right now? Do you simply develop your bishop? Is bishop g5 a move? Mm -hmm. Might be too much because then black actually picks up the knight. It was a nice little idea and maybe we can uh, at some point show it that you can get tempted to improve your, to develop your bishop. But you have to watch out. Black's got his own army. Black does have that bishop that can pick up the knight at any point. So not a good idea to rush in with that. He instead decides to really break in black's pawn wow. structure with b4. Just shifts the play to the other side of the board. Yeah, throwing a pawn forward and uh, forcing Hikaru to start uh, looking for weaknesses or looking at his own weaknesses, actually, all over the board. And really interesting, I've got to say by Magnus, he's just banking on the fact that Black's pieces aren't ready for the position to open up yet, especially that Black King in the centre. If lines do open, that will be the one under fire. And uh, I'm trying to work out the consequences here. I'm not sure if it is a pawn sacrifice. Perhaps it is short term for Magnus Carlsen. But either way, um, a very logical move, very ambitious move, showing Magnus isn't playing for the draw. He's following that conventional wisdom that uh, even though a draw is fine for him, he wants the win. He wants to so uh, settle it here and now. Yeah, the only way to win a pawn, as David is highlighting, is that black has a part with the bishop pair. But by taking this knight on d5, no matter how you take it, you open up the board. So let's say bishop takes d5, the pawn takes back, and now you say, give me that b4 pawn. All is good. The white bishop can slide up to d3, hit this rook on g6, and you just see the free-flowing nature of white's pieces. The a1 rook can slide one file over to b1, and that's why Hikaru avoided this altogether. He says, it's not worth the pawn. I'm probably not going to be able to keep it. My king is in the center. So instead, he just takes this pawn on b4. The knight just recaptures. And I feel like with this position opening up and the black king in the center, it's all good news for Magnus. The, all that said, that in the long term, look at these pawns on the queen side. a2 and c2, they're split, which means if the queens come off the board, that's a dream for Hikaru. If the queens come off, then white has some pawns to worry about. But with all the major pieces in the open files, that's good news for Magnus's miners and his rooks. I don't believe that there's going to be a long term in this game with that black king stuck on e8 it's hard to imagine the pieces being traded off magnus is one is going to want to go for that king and uh, there are all these ideas of developing the bishop bringing your rook to the center of the board advancing the c pawn further as well to create more problems what black has achieved out of the opening is just one open g file but white's key piece that bishop on f1 it is a sweet defender it just controls everything watch out for one thing though that bishop from d7 can always eye that h3 pawn. Right now, Magnus's queen defends it because the pawn on g2 is pinned, but he needs to make sure he doesn't move that queen anywhere else, keeps it there. I'm expecting developing moves, get the rooks connected, move the pawn up. Magnus decides not to wait. He wants to start with it, takes control of that d5 square, and a further advance of the c pawn is always in the air, breaking up the center. Yeah, really nice move, just keeping control. But as you mentioned there, Tanya, hinting that you might start intruding, invading at some point later. And here, as Hikaru, I would be wanting to curl up into a ball, maybe just put the, the uh, bishop in front of my king, just say, OK, you're never getting past these pieces. That's a uh, perfect uh, defensive formation. But OK, your other idea now on the board, Tanya, I'm loving how you're predicting everything this tournament. Uh, instead of that, after the pawn marched forward, Hikaru just shuffles his queen across. Not the most subtle threat. This one is pretty obvious, but he does want to capture this pawn uh, utilizing the pin. I'm expecting Magnus just to shuffle into the corner at some point and say, OK, no more pin on the G file, meaning uh, that this pawn on H3 is not up for grabs. Interesting move. Uh, it feels like a one mover, but uh, at least he's forcing Magnus onto the defensive. And Hikaru's king might have to stay in the center. So if that's the case, he might throw that B-pawn up the board as well. So he's aiming in all directions. It's like throwing darts with a blindfold on. He's hoping that he lands the good numbers, but it's just looking promising for white. One move threats from Black's perspective, easy to take care of. And we see actually now that Hikar brings his dark square bishop out to H6. Uh, the good news, his rook may land uh, in, on where the bishop is right now after a trade and attack the white king. Uh, the bad news is this D6-pawn is a permanent weakness, and the Dark Square Bishop was the only piece covering it. So it's a pro and con situation. I really love Magnus' position. It just seems much healthier. Yeah, and again, the question for Magnus is, do you trade on Black's terms or do you wait for Black to exchange you? So, uh, for example, this Bishop trade now helps the Black Rook get closer to the White King along this line. But if you wait, I'm not sure exactly how you wait, but if you wait for a move, for example, push a pawn, then yes, Black can trade, but it's on your terms. You improve your White Rook in the, in the process and suddenly this White Rook will be supporting uh, the motoring forward of this pawn a bit later. So I'm expecting Magnus not just to go for that yet, a 
Okay, he plays a very useful move, first of all. He opens up his rook on the semi-open B-file and uh, potentially targets later. Watch out for this pawn being a weakness long term. So Black's position full of weaknesses, but his pieces are relatively active right now. That's the uh, payoff that he's got for all these committal decisions. I love that last move. He just brings the other rook into the game, saying that if you take the bishop, I'm going to pick up the bishop with uh, my rook on, on the central file currently, and then we'll see both of White's rook just... Uh, in the best places in the position, really, targeting that queen as well as that pawn on b7. The knight can jump to the center of the board. It looks like very aggressive play by Hikaru in the opening is only reaping rewards for Magnus currently with Black's king stuck in the center with the long-term weakness of that pawn in front uh, of the bishop as well as the queen side backward b7 pawn. Hikaru for now tries to get the king to safety. He's sort of doing this... Uh, unnatural castling, this uh, where he just marches with the king to safety towards the king side, but it's going to use a lot of time. Meanwhile, Magnus can continue with development and target the weaknesses in black spawn structure. Yeah, castling by hand, they call it. And actually, every game now, I think three games out of three, we've seen one side castle, one side not castle, just move their king instead. Mm -hmm. uh, bit of a trend there. But uh, yeah, meanwhile, that black king looks pretty safe hiding behind its own pieces right now. Um, so a very logical move, and as Tanya says, we're expecting Magnus to up some pressure, still maybe maintain the tension between the dark square bishops, maybe just shuffle a rook across that black d6 pawn, the backward pawn on that square that we highlighted earlier. Still the target, still you have to go for it at some point as white. The bar is inching up for Magnus Carlsen with the white pieces. If he wins it, he will win the Air Things Masters. I do see some selfies with uh, several people cheering for Hikaru Nakamura. He needs at least a draw and he has to win either this one or the next game. It's intense for Hikaru Nakamura right now and he is ticking down to six minutes on the clock, but he has the advantage on the clock right now. He really does need all the support he can get and uh, I, the last move that Magnus made. I mean, it is so counterintuitive because we've been talking about that weak d6 pawn. Then Magnus instead jumps in with the knight, trades it. He fixes the center only because he wants bishop activity at some point. Uh, and this, I, I wasn't expecting that because I really liked that black had that weakness on d6. But now he sort of made sure that he can't get through to that Magnus. It's a little surprising for me what he's done. Yeah, so he's kind of connected his own pawns in the center here, Magnus Carlsen. Those two white central pawns now look uh, pretty impressive, but he's also covered Black's weaknesses. It makes him ha it harder for the white rooks to uh, find a job to be employed here. I guess there's still the semi-open B file. Maybe white will stack up rooks on uh, over there later. But I think the problem for Hikaru is how to get active. Mm. The Black King is always going to be slightly open. That Black Rook looks a bit redundant now on the King side on the H file. I don't think you've got any attack now that all of the Knights are off of the board and the other Rook still at home, not connecting with its pieces. It's all these tiny, small problems for Black adding up maybe into a bigger issue. Yeah, as you're saying, Black lacks harmony. That Rook on H6, it looked like a great aggressive piece. Now it's just staring at a brick wall, protected pawn structure for White in front of his king. But B5 is shot from Mikaru Nakamura, but it's not an active shot. I think it's actually a defensive one. He saw that pawn on B7 as a long-term weakness. He said, let's trade it off. And he wants to activate the Rook near his queen. It hasn't moved, but you can activate it in the, its starting square if pawns are traded in front of it. So if White decides to take on B5, Black takes back, and you'll see the Rook on 8 stare all the way down towards that pawn on A2. So that's good news for Hikaru. But I also think for uh, Magnus, I mean, he can just go for something like this. All he needs is to draw the next two games. So at worst comes the worst. He just takes this pawn on B5 and enters a position where he is risking absolutely nothing. His king is fine. Uh, Black king not doing so badly with the limited material, but there's no way Magnus Carlsen loses a position like this. Yeah, We've been talking, David, about trading on your own terms, and this line is an option. White can also just look at in the initial position, bringing that rook to the other open file, where you say, yeah, sure, you can get rid of that B pawn weakness, but I am going to uh, target your queen, get my rooks into the the game. So some pleasant options here for Magnus, how he decides to find a solution to uh, Hikaru's last move, which asks him the question, what do you want to do with that C4 pawn? I'm liking Magnus's chances more and more. And I'm still thinking about that knight trade in the center. It's just such a classy move because it's really something that not many of us would think about. But this is the world champion. He's always thinking out of the box. Yeah. And here you ask the Black Queen, what are you going to do? 
Uh, what you're going to do when they come for you and that Black Queen is not happy at all. I'm trying to look for safe squares. Actually, if she has to sh shuffle to one side, then again, this variation that Robert showed, uh, for example, trading everything off, suddenly the White Rooks have easy access into the seventh rank and I would be fearful for Black's life in a variation like this. Maybe you can defend by uh, kind of getting across with your Rook, but it does look a bit scary and uh, either of these two White Rooks could start infiltrating the Black camp later on. I love that idea, Tanya, and... Looks like Magnus thinking for a long time now, but uh, he might come up with that one. Mm -hmm. Bad boy, bad boy. <laughs> <laughs> Both of them bad boys, they're beasts on the board. <laughs> but Magnus down to under you know, just about three minutes, uh, it seems, and he di does decide to trade. And probably it's the match situation influencing him. No risk involved with this exchange. Uh, the bishops come off. All of a sudden, we have queen, two rooks, and four pawns per side. Nothing really to write home about, but for Magnus Carlsen, probably just want to limit all risk. And if he can play for a win from there, he will, but he just does not want to lose. Yeah, and Hikaru needs to keep some time advantage if he wants to win this game. I think uh, Robert's spot on with his prediction there. It's just balanced now. It looks very level after a bishop trade, after that black rook on the A-file goes to grab that pawn back. But, uh, yeah, he needs to hustle on the clock, maybe put some, uh, Magnus under some pressure there, at least set the tone, set the foundations for the final game of the day. Uh, if this one is a draw, you need to make sure that Magnus goes into it in a negative, passive mindset. And, OK, that whole sequence that we predicted on the board now, big threat on the board. White's Rook wants to lift itself up to the eighth rank, pinning that Black Queen, winning that Black Queen. But, uh, of course, Nakamura has a timeout. He gets his king to safety first before anything too bad happens mm -hmm. and, and uh, still tense now white can actually put his rook on the seventh rank as well magnus can target that f7 weakness bringing his rook into the game into the attack it just looks like if anyone's putting any pressure in this position it's got to be white on black's king uh, black's queen is going to be tied down to defending so many weaknesses this one is playing for two results for white either it ends in a draw or magnus wins and wins the championship. Dr. Mechterstein in the Twitch uh, chat saying Magnus it's, is ending it in this game, Oof. but uh, someone else pointing out that Magnus is getting low on time though. Yeah. And uh, ticking down to two and a half minutes, Magnus Carlsen. That's never a good sign. It does plant a seed of doubt in your mind, uh, especially when you've been ahead on the clock throughout the whole day, as Magnus has been. Uh, but there we go. He drops a rook on that black back rank, on the eighth rank, attacking the black queen. And you have to be slightly careful where you plant her. Uh, I think you have to run down the C file somewhere. You have plenty of choice. I'm not sure which is the most accurate square, but you've got to be careful. Some attacks potentially against the black king. I'd be going queen C4. He chooses the more aggressive approach. I thought queen C4 to slide over to F4. If the black queen is in front of the white queen with check, those Queens come off the board. I know it looks like an ugly pawn structure, but with limited material, it should actually be an easy hold for Hikaru. But he says, let's keep them on the board because if now the queens are swapped somehow, Black's pawn structure is healthier. The pawn on d5 is an isolated pawn that Black can go after. Now there's immediate pressure on the f2 pawn as well. Hikaru saying, let's give us both chances here, but we're not just going to make a straightforward draw. Yeah, I really like that move. Uh, like you said, Robert, maybe going to another square was safer, but this one at least asks questions of Magnus and down under the two minute mark. Magnus needs to play actively. He needs to start playing accurately as well because suddenly that third result is in the picture. Maybe it's not as safe as we've been predicting for him, but there we go. He jumps in. It's like black has invaded the white army, uh, the white camp. White has invaded the black camp and uh, whose attack is going to pay off first. Big threat. But black, big threat, but black can fall back with the queen. I was also going to say black can come in with the rook and defend and attack white's queen. It would have resulted in a couple of checks, but instead, Hikaru falls back with the queen, not allowing any perpetuals that would have been possible in the other line. And it still looks like it's getting tricky for white. Wow, I love this move that he's played. He simply brings back the rook. We talk about a rook lift. This is a rook retreat with the same idea of transferring a rook from the queen side all the way to the king side. Rook g4 is a massive threat on the board, pinning that queen to that king. And how is black going to stop that? Can I just shout out this uh, tweet we have here? They're cheering <laughs> for the Hessen chess. I, I mean, love it. Yeah, <laughs> That's an automatic winner, so uh, cheers to you two. You must have heard that before, Hess and Chess. Or is... uh, of course, yeah. yeah. Countless times. Yes, why, why does it, exactly, why does my name start world with World Hess C, Championship. All of that, the World Hess <laughs> Championship, all that stuff. So a uh, shout out to Luisa. I appreciate that. But this uh, position right now, there is a big threat. The rook just slid up to the B4 square. I mean, it's trying to go over in front of the queen with a pin. So Hikaru's task is actually not that simple here. It's not just let's just trade pieces because those rooks for white are just 
just more coordinated and more active than that bla the black rook, especially that rook next to the queen. I think that rook actually just slide up one square to meet the white rook sliding to the G file with the black rook sliding in front. So you're just trying to trade off pieces as quickly as possible. Yeah, maybe we can check out Stockfish's top moves here because black is on the defensive. How big is the margin for error? How many moves do you have? Okay, only Ooh. two moves Ooh. to survive in this game. And both of them use the same square. So either the Black Queen has to slide to the H5 square or the Black Rook that we said uh, that Robert was highlighting as being caged, a bit trapped, needs to slide down one square. Neither of those are obvious, I've got to say. Um, they both do react. They do get ready to counter White's threat of the Rook sliding, but... I'm not sure I'd find that with only two minutes left on the clock. Maybe we show this on the board as well. Uh, two moves now for Hikaru to stay in the game. Keep the balance. Is he going to find them? Either queen to h5. Okay, he's he just playing. It. It. Yeah, he is very good. All these top players, if you give them a narrow path, they will navigate their way. But uh, the idea here is to meet this check with a block. Suddenly, this unemployed black rook finds a job. And uh, now the trade here will uh, make Black's defensive task easier. Really, really great, uh, resourceful, tenacious move there from Hikaru. And so important in a very critical moment where it's so easy to go wrong. He does find the right way, but this just means that pieces get traded off. And Magnus inches closer towards that draw, which he can't be too unhappy about, uh, with just one round to go, which would mean that Hikaru has to throw Must just win. the... Yeah, the kitchen sink at him. Wow. Just everything. Queen h5 played, and now Magnus is thinking, does he go in with a check, which would also trade a pair of rooks, or does he immediately trade queens? Uh, I don't see a third option. Do you think Magnus wants to keep the queens on the board and keep the pressure on? I think Magnus should just want to get out of this game with a draw now, under 40 seconds on the clock. Suddenly, if he keeps the tension, there we go, he gets the queens off. But if he keeps the tension, suddenly Hikaru might start getting ambitious, might start hustling him. Uh, but look at that black rook now on the second rank, eyeing up some pawns. Still not over, still not completely safe for white. He gives a check, forcing the Black King out of its hiding place. And uh, I still think three results possible, despite the reduced material. Despite the fact it's a rook end game and it has naturally drawish tendencies, I think Hikaru has some small chances. But he doesn't look too happy, shaking his head there. Maybe this last move by Magnus, by Magnus really accurate, forcing, uh, forcing a repetition. Yeah, there might be a repetition that you're talking about with the king falling backwards, uh, t uh, controlling that d6 pawn, but none of that happens because Hikaru really just wants to play this till the very end instead of defending that point, pawn, going for a passive defense, which would have probably ended in a repetition. He picks up the f2 pawn, but this can get dangerous now. I think if anyone's better, it's black. So I think that Magnus now has to give the check, and he's doing just that. He'll give this king all the checks, and there's nowhere for the king to escape. Because if the king tries to run away to the queen side, let's say king goes uh, back to the uh, back rank, then the f7 pawn would have been hanging. So instead, we see the king go up, and it will go back. If you're king f5 here, which Hikaru, you know he wants to play, that could be playing with fire, and he may be the one who gets burned that king all the way up the board. It's not helping. Oh, Whoa, and he goes for it. it. Okay. Wow. Risks it for the biscuit. And uh, that white rook now, the white rook on g4 is going to move. There's going to be massive threats. Uh, if uh, I still know checkmate threats because that white pawn on g2 is pinned. But there we go. That black king in big danger. But Hikaru, he's performing a balancing act here. Tightrope act with that black king. It's surviving for now. But that black rook on the side of the board also offside and white's rook, uh, white pawn, sorry, it's racing forward. Magnus making that move with three seconds on the clock. Well, this one could still go either way. I love the risks Hikaru is taking, but he looks nervous right now. And how can he back up that bravery, that act of courage of advancing his king? It's so important that the rook on d2 pins the g pawn because g4 check would have forked the king of the rook. Now the rook's come off the board, and black's pawn structure is healthier. We see a pass pawn on d6, but it's also a liability because when black's king ventures backwards, you can scoop up that pawn. So this is critical territory for Magnus Carlsen with just seconds on his clock. And look at Hikaru. He is digging in. He wants to take this game. Yeah, he's feeling confident. And you're right there, Robert. Black's Rook is active. Black's Rook is actually tying down the White King, eyeing up that White Pawn. But, OK, what's happened here? Hikaru reacting, what's laughing, because now the White Rook is going to retreat, perhaps. He's a Pawn up. He should keep playing. And the reason is because a White can switch the Rook from the check to attacking that H Pawn, and then Black will, at some point, have to give that up. I'm not sure. Why is, why is Hikaru laughing? Because there's a critical uh, line right here if we can actually analyze, and this might just happen. Uh, I think he sees Magnus bring his rook down to g4, but Black can offer the rook. You see Hikaru points the finger. He said, maybe this is a winning endgame. Rook d4 for Black. That is the critical line. You s sacrifice a pawn on the d4 square. He has played it, and Magnus Whoa! says, I can't trade it. So Magnus, the <laughs> analysis bar says that would have been a winning endgame for Black. Instead, Magnus, he saw oh, through that. He keeps the rooks on the board, but that's why Hikaru was upset 
said he thought it would be immediately a draw. <sighs> then he said, no, 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 the king and pawn game would have been winning for black. Yeah, now he's simply a pawn up and he can try and nurse this to, to victory. He's just going to advance these pawns slowly and steadily. He's got great winning chances, Hikaru. Magnus down at only 12 seconds. We were showing a line that could have happened, the king of pawn end game where Hikaru would have won, but uh, Magnus did dodge it successfully and the game goes on. Now this is going to be a long grind, but it's all about these two pawns, those central pawns for Hikaru. But look at the bar on the live board as well and the clock is ticking for Magnus. 16, 11, 10 seconds left for the world number one. Yeah. And a really difficult position to hold because Hikaru can just play forever. He's got to push those pawns at some point, get that king into the game. These are real winning chances here for Black. It's the best position that Hikaru's had all match. It all comes down to this, but what a turnaround and what a way to make this a possibility. Just hats off to Hikaru for doing this. He needs to get this game now. He needs to win this one. If he doesn't, then I fear that the match will be over in the next one. Magnus will feel he has uh, a second life. But, OK, just repeating now, Hikaru yes. not committing to a plan. Yeah, the last couple of moves just shows that he's not really sure where that winning technique is. What is that winning plan? He, of course, has to shuffle around a bit with every move. He gets three seconds on the clock, but he needs to keep that pressure on Magnus's clock as well. Yeah, the problem is for Black is you really would like to take his G2 pawn for the H4 pawn, like release your own rook. Uh, that would be good. You want connected pass pawns that are unopposed, but Magnus is not allowing that. He's giving the king a bunch of checks. You could run forward, but then the rook will continue to follow the king, push it to the other side of the board, and then start going after the Black pawns. So this is exactly what Magnus is doing. Hikaru has to step back and look at this back and forth shuffling pieces. The H4 pawn remains a target. The Black rook has to stay passively defending rather than going after White's pawns. Yeah, but there maybe Black's uh, plan should have been to get the Rook to the second rank to tie down that White King to the G-Pawn. You mentioned, Robert, that you have to go for that trade. You have to get that remaining uh, White Pawn on G2 in order to get your central pawns rolling. And now he's kind of tied up his own Rook, Hikaru. I don't li like where the Black Rook is placed. It's in front of its own pawns, blocking your only plan of advancing them. And now, really classy from Magnus, he just cuts off the Black King. The Black King now can never step down the board to the sixth rank and uh, has to start marching over to harass that Rook. But uh, again, Magnus is going to start attacking some pawns, just keeping those uh, Black pieces honest, keeping the Black Rook or King tied down. Maybe Magnus is going to get the draw of the bar back closer towards the center, but... Okay, now decision time for Hikaru. Do you surrender your central pawns and go for white's pawns? No, you have to keep your pawns intact in the middle uh, just to keep some chances alive. An important theoretical endgame is if white loses both pawns for the e5 pawn, that is a theoretical draw. I know from experience, I had that position against Vishwanath and Anand. I had the two pawns. He held the draw. And so it's something that both players know, and that's why Hikaru is clinging on to this e pawn. He pushes it forward. He connects it with his other pawn, and that will create threats if the black king gets active. That bl black king, we're on the fourth or fifth rank up to g5 that would be good news but the king is cut off magnus's rook is in the perfect position yeah if that king was better placed that black king i think he'd be winning hikaru but he's going for it now he's pushing his pawns without his king Ooh, this is either very good or it will blow the winning chances i do fear for hikaru that actually now the black rook is stuck defending its own pawns you need to connect the king with your pieces with the rest of your army magnus can he hold this one with less than 10 seconds he's doing all the right things so far. The most important thing for Magnus is to make sure that Black's king doesn't advance. And that's what he Ooh. does. He does keep the king blocked, but the bar does not approve of that. And uh, I'm wondering why not? Does Black have something really strong? The winning plan is not going to be obvious for any human here, uh, let alone these players with only a few seconds left on their clock. And uh, I'm expecting Hikaru to move his rook away at some point. You need to activate those Black pawns. At the moment, everything's a bit stuck. Black Rook needs to move. Magnus Carlsen doesn't believe in fortresses. He famously said that. But I do think that we could see a fortress here. I know the eval bar looks like it's great for Black, but sometimes you can't actually break through. But look, the Rook retreat, that means the Black King can step forward. That is not good news for Magnus. And watch out for Hikaru to bring his king up and then push his F4 pawn to F3. Just jettison that pawn so his king can enter the position and go for checkmating ideas. Yeah, note how Hikaru just from time to time, he repeats the position just to put the pressure back on Magnus. Uh, just to say, okay, I'm in control. Uh, you, we're definitely not going for a draw, but I'm just going to tease you with that. And look at this. Suddenly the white rook moves. And What's happening? Can the black rook make headway against the lone white king? Maybe you needed to check from the bottom of the board and then go behind the white king. Is Hikaru winning? It feels like he should be. The Black King is so active now. We said as long as the Black King joins the action, you're winning. But what's the killer plan? And Hikaru stops. Blow? He takes a pause. He knows that there's something in the position. He's trying to calculate, and that is the right thing to do. He knows that he's made maximum progress.
grass, but where is the killer blow here? He's going to bring his king all the way in at some point. His rook is going to be released from the F file somewhere along the second rank, and the black king is going to snake for a D4, D3 into E2, and whoa, whoa. he plays F3 right away. And was that a good choice? I'm surprised he committed with, st uh, with so little time on the clock. He could have repeated and gone back to this. Robert, earlier you mentioned that F pawn and H pawn together is a draw, but E pawn and H pawn is winning because they're so far apart. White's defenses will be stretched. Can the black king come in now? Is it still winning? This is so close. It does look like because you, every time you do move your rook away from here, white king steps forward and everything is under control. He's got to get the king into the attack to save, to help that E pawn advance further. I'm expecting a king advance right now, but watch out for a rook check that might pick up the H pawn. Yeah, you have to be careful where you put the Black King right now. You don't want to allow any nasty checks from the White Rook behind. OK, he retreats his Rook really clever. Now look at the White King. It's cut off. It can never move towards that Black Central Pawn because the Black Rook cuts along the F-file and Hikaru bobs his head. He thinks he's winning. It does look very strong. The King is wow. coming now. Wait, but he's going to check. How is he going to run away? Because King goes to the C-file, the Rook just slides over and you can't push the E-Pawn. And now there are, you have more distance from the King. So the King goes to D3, Whoa. you see the bar go back to e equal. So he reacts Hikaru. As well. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I thought he still had great winning chance, but he allows the king forward, but then the rook comes G3 with check. So that's why Magnus slides backwards and his king is no longer cut off. That means that Magnus Carlsen should be able to hold. Yeah, Hikaru, maybe there was a more accurate way of doing it. It wasn't easy, even if it was winning. And suddenly Magnus's rook is active. Suddenly you can start giving checks from the side. And, and now he wants to come with the king to the other side. He wants to uh, create an opposition and try and attack White's king, create a mating net, but Magnus slides all the way back with the rook to give backward checks to Black's king. And this just looks like with the Black rook stuck here, there will be no saving the Black king from checks anymore. We're going to see 100 checks, but the result will be the same. This will end in a draw. Wow, nowhere safe to hide. If the Black Rook could move away, the Black King could hide in front of its own pawns, or its own H pawn, but now there's nowhere, there's nowhere safe. If you have to start retreating the Black King towards the White Rook, then suddenly your pawns might drop off. And look at Hikaru. He's, he's so furious. frustrated right now. And it's the wrong pawn, the H pawn. So if the king goes back, the white king steps forward, the rook will take this pawn on E3, and the king is inside the square. When king and pawning games, you try to chase down the pawn, you make a square to the promotion uh, point. And here... He, oh, it's okay. H3, the pawn goes forward. Still alive. But no more progress. I think black is completely frozen now. Uh -huh. But uh, what happens once the Black King starts running over? Still nowhere to hide, I guess. And, uh, okay, we're past the 100 move mark. This has been a marathon game. Can Hikaru squeeze out a win? What a fight. Mag Magnus thinks he's drawing. He leant back there, looking very happy with himself. But uh, still, chances are live. I agree with Robert. I think it's the wrong pawn. The Black Rook is just on the worst possible square, tied down, defending both of them. The Black Rook is passive. You need active pieces to win these types of endgames. Oh, what a miracle this is if Magnus holds. And it's just amazing the defense that he's shown. And we can see Hikaru that he's giving up on this. He knows that there's no way to improve this position further. The Black's Rook is tied down to defending that E3 pawn and the H3 pawn. Magnus continues to attack the Black King with checks. There's no place to hide. And we see Hikaru leaning back. He knows he's done everything, but it's not been enough. So, so close, but no cigar. Down under 10 seconds now, Hikaru. He looks like he's about to give up his winning attempts, about to agree that draw. Just all the checks. Look at that Black King. So sad. Has to retreat the whole way back. And uh, this pattern's just going to continue. The Black King's going to chase the White Rook, but to no avail. The uh, White Rook is just going to move, hide, check and uh, cause all the problems in the world. And at this point, Hikaru might just be going for the longest game in Champions Chess Tour history because <laughs> uh, we're at move 116, it seems, and it's going to keep going because Hikaru is just going to hope for a Magnus Carlsen mistake. But the issue for Hikaru, his rook is completely frozen in place. If it ever leaves the third rank, the pawns are going to fall off, and the king, it wants to help out in protecting the pawns, but the rook keeps checking. So as long as the king is far away from the rook, the rook keeps checking it, and the king has nowhere to hide. And we see that happening, and now he just shifts back because there's nothing to be done, and it doesn't matter where the king goes. When the king gets closer to the pawns, Magnus starts checking it, driving it away. Yep. No progress has been made over the last 20 moves now. Hikaru, wow. It's can heartbroken. He yeah, can he recover from this heartbreak? And uh, lots of cheerleaders we see for Hikaru uh, on Twitter. And yeah, he's put up such a fight. I love everything Hikaru's done this game. Just Is that a Hikachu? Hikachu. <laughs> Hikaru or a Hikachu? Yeah. It's just so close. This is the most frustrating thing in chess. You do everything right. Hikaru's literally not put a foot wrong this game. But yeah. 
breaking the defences of uh, the world number one, that's another question. That's another level. But there is something to take away from it. The fact that Hikaru was able to create this chance, this opportunity with the Black Pacers. David, earlier you were talking about going into the last round on his terms and that's what he's managed to create. He's made it clear that Magnus needs to be careful. There we have it. Game three is a draw so close for Hikaru Nakamura to make that comeback. He is not happy, but he does still have another chance. Game four will start start in five minutes. That's going to be must win for Hikaru Nakamura. What a game we have been witnessing. And here is today's Lisa Veta learning point. And today's learning point is about never giving up. Magnus Carlsen held this seemingly hopeless endgame against Hikaru Nakamura, despite being a pawn down, despite having a passive king, and despite Black's pawn being so strong and uh, so close to promotion. Here, White started giving checks from the side, a very typical pattern in a rook endgame. And actually, Black could have won if he'd chosen the best squares for his king. The way to get out of these checks was to go away from the Black pawn, to step down the board. And if White continues checking the Black king, Yes, you're happy to step away, but now no more checks. The white rook has to move, and black with a rook jump now would be winning. Simply, the black king will come round, help the pawn from the other side. It's slow, but surely eventually winning. Instead, Hikaru moved his king to the wrong square, and suddenly no progress to be made. All these checks from the side, all the checks from the back later on in the game, saved Hikaru Nakamura. So keep trying to defend, and rook end games, they're very difficult. Study them. It doesn't look like much. But neither would a Sicilian defense to the untrained eye. This is a performance enhancer. You don't see it. How about now? Manage your air quality, sharpen your performance, change the game with air things. <sighs> Oh, the drama, you guys. We still might have Armageddon today. And if we do, we are asking you guys to tweet your predictions. What will be the winning bid, the lowest bid in case of an Armageddon? Tweet your answer using the hashtag ChessChamps. And the one who gets the closest to the answer wins this AirThings device signed by Magnus Carlsen himself. And remember, the special deal, $100 off air things if you use the QR code on the bottom of the screen. All right, we have to breathe. Let's take a quick Twitch break. If you're not a subscriber, but if you are subscribing on twitchchess.com, then we're going to hang out here in the studio. Definitely drama in Division 1 Grand Final with uh, Magnus and Hikaru. Division 2 Grand Final also happening. What's the status there, Ivanka? Yeah, there was definitely drama there as well because we left it, the score was even, but Fabiano, he just showed what a world-class player he is because he immediately struck back and won with the white pieces. And now they're playing game four and now it's Fabi who is under tremendous pressure. You have to remember, Yu Yang Yi is in a must-win situation. He needs to take it to Armageddon if he has any chance for this grand reset. Okay, so game four happening there. It's must-win for Yu Yang Yi to take Take it to uh, Armageddon mm -hmm. and uh, a potential reset. Same situation for Hikaru Nakamura. <laughs> no. He only has five minutes to get ready for that final game. What do you think Hikaru is doing right now? I mean, the last game was probably a little bit frustrating for him. So I would say shake it out, you know, just take it move by move. Don't think about the whole result or what's going to happen next. Focus on the chess. All right. And maybe do some puzzles. Well, Probably hasn't, doesn't have time for that. We, we do have a really nice puzzle that you brought with you today, Ivanka. What is uh, the thought behind this puzzle? Yeah, it's my favorite puzzle, to be honest, and I love it so much. And uh, here we see it is white to play. Please note that black has two queens on the board, but black's king is in troubles. And uh, white does have a winning continuation here. Beautiful puzzle. Grand final, game four, must win for Hikaru Nakamura is coming up in just a few minutes. Hikaru Nakamura, he cannot lose and he has to win either this one or the next one. There we go, we have it. <laughs> Gary the G4 makes an appearance, G5, he's going for Magnus' king. The bar is inching up for Magnus Carlsen with the white pieces. White has invaded the black camp, whose attack is going to pay off first. Wow, what a game. Big, big chances for Hikaru to make that comeback. Eventually a draw though, and that means Hikaru has to win game 
four. Do you think that was his chance, Robert, or uh, can he do it in game four, Hikaru? It felt like roles were reversed in that game. It felt like Hikaru was playing like Magnus, and then Magnus was defending like Hikaru. These are two titans of <laughs> online chess, and for Hikaru, it's going to be disappointing, but he's proven to himself that he can get an advantage against Magnus Carlsen, and we'll see what he brings with the white pieces, but he's going to have to give it his all. White pieces for Hikaru must win. What do you expect, David? Um, I'm not sure in terms of openings because Hikaru can do everything, but he has to bring the same mentality, not be afraid to throw pawns forward like he did in that previous game, which uh, eventually gave him all those chances, and he calculated so well. More importantly, he had a clock advantage. He had uh, an extra minute or two on the, tie on the clock over Magnus throughout the entire game, and that really got him close to victory. But in the meantime, repetition of game two of the day. Are we surprised that Hikaru is going back into this opening? And this is where it changes. What we saw was a queen trade, but the other, the bishop pawn had advanced up the board, and it looks like Hikaru did a little preparation. He switched it up a little, but we still have an endgame. The queens have been traded off, as Robert likes to call it, a queenless uh, middle game, because there, every other piece is on the board. Now, I have to say, when the match starts, and Hikaru, after losing that first game, it looked like mission impossible to even come back into that match. But what we saw in game three, it showed us what Hikaru is capable of, the pressure that he surmounted on Magnus. And Magnus knows that it's not going to be easy with the black pieces. But I'm still surprised that Hikaru has an approach to go for a queen trade so early on in a win on demand game. Yeah, very rarely works against Magnus Carlsen to get the queens off and somehow outmaneuver him. And uh, it clearly looks like Magnus has done his research too. Well, you said it rarely works, but it just almost worked to perfection <laughs> for Hikaru Nakamura. The queens came off. It was an endgame. Uh, the evaluation bar, the computer said, oh, it's equal. And Hikaru said, not so fast. I have a more active king, and he won upon it almost the game. But I feel like Hikaru is misunderstood as this tactical player. He is a brilliant tactician. We've seen him do puzzle rush. We've seen his great games under the duress on the clock. But he actually loves these intricate positions with full of subtleties and nuances where he can just play uh, a neutral position. I think that maybe this one doesn't feel like a must-win position because it's just a symmetrical structure of both sides putting their pieces in similar squares. But I do think that Hikaru definitely has what it takes to win a position just like this, even against Magnus Carlsen. Yeah, he definitely has what it takes, but it feels like the next few moves are critical because if Black does get organized, if Black does get rooks to the center, start challenging for the defile, then all the pieces are going to disappear very fast from the board and Magnus' chance, uh, Magnus's chances of drawing will be increased uh, with them. So, yeah, it definitely feels like Hikaru, he's going into the tank at the right moment. He needs to create some uh, little imbalance, at least something for Magnus to sweat about, but uh, it's not going to be easy. And with that last move, Magnus creates a threat on the board. He has pinned that knight, as we can see, to that rook on d1. And what he wanted to do was bring his own knight to the center of the board. Uh, knight d4 was a huge threat on the board, making a, taking advantage of that pin. Hikaru continues to develop, stopping that threat, brings the bishop to the e3 square, connects the rook. What he wants to do next is push that rook one step ahead, also signaling at a doubling up along the only open file on the board. You've got rooks, bring them on the open files. Yep, good, uh, good logic there, good strategy. And now up to Magnus. How is he going to improve his position? We know he hates to castle. The trend has been that one side castles and the other side doesn't uh, throughout this match so far today. But uh, if he wants to connect the rooks, if he wants to challenge for the defile, he might have to commit at some point to bring his king to this flank just to get his rook in the game. Also, just want to point out one interesting idea that Black had. If you just go one move back instead of bishop to e coming to e3, White could have also thought about just pushing and provoking that bishop from g4 by the move h h3. But then, again, what we were talking about, bishop trades the knight and the knight jumps to d4. And now notice how that c2 pawn is attacked and the bishop is attacked. And in fact, this would have resulted in Black winning a pawn. So Magnus there setting up these small tricks, but of course, Hikaru is ready for them. He made the right choice by developing that bishop. He's very alert right now. Yeah, very alert. So he's covering this key square that the Black Knight wanted to jump into. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what Magnus should be doing. For example, if Black does castle, again, awkward question. Now this bishop will be challenged. And if you don't want to retreat with your head uh, hanging low here, if you don't want to just uh, admit that you've lost a move, then you will take this knight. But suddenly, imbalance. Two bishops. Yes, it's a closed position in the center, but later on, watch them come to life. So uh, Hikaru has something to be optimistic about.
in this position. Yeah, and I think it's also tempting with an open file to put your rooks there. White already has a rook on the D file uh, in the live position. And if black tries to challenge right away, that would actually be a mistake. We've been talking about how Magnus is taking advantage of the pin on the knight. The rook takes the rook, that eliminates the pin. If you take with the knight, you actually lose a pawn immediately on e5. That would be a blunder. And if you take instead with the king to keep that pawn protected, the knight jumps the other way, up to g5. There is no pin. f is under attack. I'm going to push my pawn to h3 next. My rook is still going to slide to the open file. And there's only one open line, and white is the one that's going to take control of it. That it would be bad news for Magnus. That is why he's thinking here. He needs to be very careful. It seems like a position where you have countless options, all of which look good, but it does hand Hikara a little something in pretty much every line. So he's just trying to figure out the next five move, how he envisions the future. Yeah, the five-year plan, the five-move plan. <laughs> and uh, now, right now, Magnus is contemplating that. And uh, yeah, Hikari still got enough life left. Despite the absence of queens, everything else is still on the board. So mm -hmm. plenty of ammunition left. How, how big of an advantage is this for Hikari now to, to be in control of that open file? It's significant. It's pretty much the only, only thing separating the two players right now. Uh, if Magnus does get two moves, if Magnus could castle his king and then bring a rook to the central file, it's going to be equal. It's mm -hmm. going to be a draw. So uh, Hikaru, he's up half a tempo. That's what we say when white starts, uh, starts the game. And especially in positions with symmetrical pawn structures, that is extremely relevant, maybe mm -hmm. the most important factor. Magnus now thinking for three oh. minutes. He was down a lot on the clock in game three. Again, Hikaru has a big advantage on the clock already. Starting to slow down, Magnus. Yeah, maybe it's the nerves. Uh, I know that myself in uh, situations, especially last rounds, I get so tense and uh, I feel, you know, it's really hard to kind of focus purely on the moves to calculate. You always start double checking everything. The stakes are so much higher, you can't blunder. And uh, yeah, as, as I get older, I feel that that sets in more and more. And of <laughs> course, Magnus, he's not that old, but uh, definitely he's slowed down at least in this game and also the previous game. But this is where Hikaru is the real expert, right? Time management in speed chess. He's phenomenal at it. I mean, he just plays all these great moves and he spends little time doing so. And he often seems invincible mm -hmm. until he plays someone like Magnus Carlsen. And I like what Magnus has done because he pushes his pawns and trades off his bishop for the knight. But what he's been doing is taking control of squares. Oftentimes we look at chess and see tactics. Uh, when we do our training positions, we're often looking at how can I checkmate my opponent or win some material. Here he's making sure that the knight on c3, the only white knight, can't hop forward without a trade. And now the bishop on f3 won't jump to a new diagonal because the pawn on h5 takes care of the g4 square in the event of a knight trade. So I really like those last two moves from Magnus Carlsen. He's just taking care of his position. He is not taking it for granted. Every little uh, situation, every little square, it matters. Yeah, and maybe a plan, a hidden plan. Uh, if he gets given the time, the opportunity, he could try to remove White's bishop pair by trading off the dark squared bishops later on. This is by far White's inferior bishop. It's blocked in by its own central pawn. This is the better bishop, therefore. And uh, if you can trade it off, even if it comes at the cost of a couple of tempi, it will be worth it. So Magnus hinting at that idea. I don't think you can rush to do that because White will have time. Uh, you could also hint that you might push this pawn forward later just to break up the White structure even further. So a multi-purpose move there from Magnus and he has the time because the queens are off the board. He doesn't need to commit his king yet and he just throws the move back to Hikaru and says, okay, you solve the issue. Is this a threat? You decide. And the other one that you were talking about, how comfortable is Hikaru allowing Magnus to further advance with that h-pawn all the way to h4, which will force white to decide with his own kingside pawns and perhaps creating more weaknesses. The only way to actually counter that threat is to push your own h-pawn one step ahead. But every pawn moves comes with its own set of drawbacks. And here it would be the weakening of that light square, the one on G4 that you're highlighting right now, David. So it's very crucial for Hikaru to really evaluate how dangerous is the threat of the H-pawn advancing down the board. And it's never an easy call. Do you push your own pawn or do you allow that to come forward just saying, you know what, one day your pawn might be a weakness? Yeah, and uh, I've noticed that, especially in rapid chess, the players, they actually invest the most time when they have to make strategic decisions, when it's about formulating that five-move plan. And uh, always the first step of that plan is the most difficult. That's why we saw Magnus Carlsen take two, three minutes out, and then he played three quick moves because it was all the rest of his plan. Now Hikaru is the one. Uh, it looks like he's suffering. He's not. He's just envisaging a plan. And uh, whether that's maybe rerouting this bishop, whether that's doubling up his rooks, as Tanya mentioned earlier, maybe shifting this rook up and the other one behind it. 
He's mulling over all of these in his mind, and then he'll decide the next three or four moves will come fast. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, manoeuvring for now. Remember, everyone, this is must-win for Hikaru Nakamura to take the grand final to an Armageddon. Also in the Armageddon, Hikaru will have to win it because he is coming from the loser's bracket. That means Magnus Carlsen, he hasn't lost a single match so far in the Air Things Masters. And uh, if he wins the grand final, he will be the winner of the Air Things Masters. Hikaru Nakamura, he needs to win the grand final to take it to a grand final reset. So he has to win this game to take it to an Armageddon and then also be the victor in Armageddon to take it to a reset. It's a lot to ask. Sounds like a lot of winning. Yeah, <laughs> it's a lot to ask against Magnus Carlsen. But if anyone can do it, it is Hikaru Nakamura. But right now, this game, it is must win for him. Guys, predictions. Are we getting an Armageddon or not? Ooh, I'm just hoping for it. I'm just really hoping for another Armageddon. I'm going to say no, just because I believe in Magnus's defensive skills and in such a simplified position, it's hard to see him going wrong. Mm. Uh, just from experience, he's the master at uh, working his magic in these types of positions. Robert? Well, for the first time, you've allowed me to agree with you, because uh, <laughs> you know what I'm going to say, and then you say the opposite. Yeah, I think that Magnus Carlsen has this one under his control, especially after Hikaru's last move. I mean, he brings his bishop to attack the knight on f6, but he's allowed the black knight to hop into the center. So I just feel like Magnus doesn't really have true weaknesses in his position. It's just kind of simple for him to play now. And unless I'm overlooking something, maybe Hikaru has a hidden idea up his sleeve. I believe Magnus has this one under control, and he's ahead in the clock. I have some news for you guys. We have a result. Fabiano Caruana is the winner of Division 2. It was a draw in Game 4. A huge win for Fabiano Caruana, winning $10,000 for winning Division 2 in the Air Things Masters. He is also now qualified for Event 2 in the Champions Chess Tour 2023. That means we will see Magnus Carlsen, Hikaru Nakamura, Wesley So, and Fabiano Caruana in Event 2. <laughs> What a lineup. I know. <laughs> Incredible, right? Just amazing stuff. I mean, these are the four big names, and we're going to see them fight against each other. We could not have asked for a better lineup. This is going to be an amazing event. But this one, Akaya, still continues. The line that you were talking about, Robert, is on the board with Black jumping up with the knight. Guys, I cannot wait. Just thinking about Wesley, Magnus, Hikaru, Fabi, fight it out. I know. It, it just, it's such a stacked field. Yeah, yeah stacked. That's the word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, incredible field. Imagine they could be joined by Faruja, Nepomnishi, like a bunch of other players. And, uh, Four other spots up wait. for grabs. There will be qualifiers uh, coming up. A total of eight players will fight it out as well in event two. And we're actually joined by Fabiano Caruana. Huge congratulations on winning Division Two, Fabi. Thank you. Thanks. What has this be uh, this week been like, and today's uh, grand final match with uh, with um, Yu Yangi? Yeah, there were a lot of tough matches. Uh, I have to say, the last one, neither of us played very well. Uh, I mean, we we both had some very strange moments, uh, especially I think when I lost in game two, and uh, how he lost in game three. But. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was uh, also under pressure in the last game. It, it was definitely a tough match. It was funny that I had to play Yang Yi twice, um, first in the winner's bracket, and then he he managed to get through the loser's bracket after I beat him the first time. Uh, but yeah, very, very happy that I managed to uh, to win. Mm -hmm. I heard rumors that you really have been working a lot on speed chess and online chess lately. Is that true? N not really. I mean, it depends what you mean by working on speed chess. Like, I, I play a lot of uh, online events now because uh, because there are so many going on. But I, I don't do anything. Like, I, I don't even know what working on speed chess really means. <laughs> <laughs> I guess just playing a lot. <laughs> yeah, if that if that's what it means, then definitely I have played quite a lot. I mean, I played in, in Almaty, the World Championships. And, uh, okay, this was quite a lot of chess, in fact, because the preliminary stage and, and I don't know how many matches I played. So it was, uh, yeah, quite a lot of speed chess for sure. Hey. Now, Fabiano, we are super excited here in the studio. Fans are super excited because for winning Division 2, you qualify for Division 1 and Event 2 in the Champions Chess Tour. What does that mean to you? Well, it, it definitely gives me um, a, a good shot in the overall standings. At least it's a good start. Of course, uh, it was it was a bit of a heartbreaker to um, 
get eliminated from Division One by losing to to Serrano. Mm-hmm. Uh, and after that, I was already uh, you know a bit dejected about the whole tournament. But uh, after going through Division Two, and I didn't even know until yesterday that it actually qualifies for Division One. That's that's sort of an icing on the cake. Yeah. And Fabi, you're used to playing the two players who are duking out for Division One right now, Hikaru Nakamura and Magnus Carlsen. What was it like playing some of these very strong grandmasters who typically don't get the spotlight that you face in Division Two? Well, it was interesting. I, uh, um, for example, I, I was very worried before I played uh, Jakubo because he had just eliminated Andraken, and uh, and I had never played him before, so it, it was a bit of an un- unknown to me. Uh, obviously, he's a young and and super talented players, so you always get extra worried for those kinds of matches. And I was even a bit happy to play Yangi because I'm more familiar with his chess. You know, we played, I think, the first time 10 years ago in, in the World Cup in, in Tromso. So uh, I, I like to play players who <laughs> who I know a little bit more about. Um, but it was also interesting to play to play some guys who uh, haven't, let's say, made their, their mark on top-level chess yet. Uh, also because you get, you know, well, I'm, I'm so familiar playing, let's say, guys like Hikaru or Wesley or Magnus, and and you get very familiar with those types of players, and then it's interesting to, to play someone fresh. Fabi, congratulations on your win. And I have a lighter question. We've all been loving and enjoying your C-Squared boss podcasts, and I want to ask you, how fun has that been for you, and who's been your favorite guest on it so far? Uh, it, it's been a lot of fun. It's been very different from what I, I've been used to my entire career, which is which is playing chess. Uh, it's still very chess centric, of course. Uh, in in terms of my favorite guest, well, we had some fun ones. I, I think Maurice Maurice Ashley was very fun. Um, Levy Rosman, who's uh, better known as Gotham Chess, was a very fun one. That was very uh, personal because we really, I think, uh, all of us opened up and and we got a good dialogue going on. Um, and yeah, there's there's been a lot of fun ones. So maybe those are the, the two that stick out most. We also interviewed Hikaru, which was probably our most watched one, which was interesting because, um, you know, Hikaru and I have always, I think, viewed each other as, as rivals for a long time, for, you know, well over a decade. I mean, he, we were even playing when when we were kids and he was a bit a bit older than me. So to to speak to him in that format was, was very different. So that was interesting. But yeah, it's, it's been a very interesting project. And uh if any one of the viewers are looking for you know, some chess uh, content, definitely check it out. Definitely. Fabiano, we are super excited to see you in Division 1 in the next uh, CCT event. Big congratulations on your big win today. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, this match is still going on. Grand final in Division 1. It's must win for Hikaru Nakamura. We've had several moves on the board. Bring us up to speed, David. Yeah, several moves, but huge developments. Magnus Carlsen now, I think, has a small advantage, if anything. And the winning chances for Hikaru Nakamura are minimal. You see it on Hikaru's face right now. The game has not gone that well for him. The pawn structure has been clarified. There have been a couple of peace trades since we last talked about the position. And Magnus is in full control, cruise control at this point. Uh, the Black Knight has gotten some nice juicy squares to jump into. The Black Rooks, as soon as they uh, combine, that will be the end of the fun. And I think this game won't go that much longer. Uh, someone contradict me, please, because I want some entertainment. Yeah. I want a decisive result, but I don't see it happening, unfortunately. Me neither. I mean, I really want to contradict you because we're all hoping for that Armageddon, David, but it's super hard in this position. And the factors are, as you mentioned, that Black's Knight just feels a lot more active. We see that F4 square in the position where Black's Knight can head it. Ask the same question for that knight that White has, that Hikaru has. No good squares for it. Uh, meanwhile, Black's pawn structure also has a lot more mobility. I can imagine a central break happening at some point with that pawn next to Black's King. Uh, Magnus Cannon advance it two steps ahead, play it on F5 once it is guarded uh, in a proper way, and that would create so many weaknesses. It just feels like Black has all the trumps here, the bigger plans in the position, while what are White's rooks doing? What is that White knight doing? And it has no targets whatsoever. Hikaru Nakamura is currently on the defense. Yeah. 
and uh, winning this game is another matter. Yes, he could probably draw it with best play, but uh, let's check out some ideas here just to show uh, how Magnus can control things. And uh, I mean, first move that came to my mind was jumping in with the knight just because we look for forcing moves first. This does gain time hitting the white rook. The white rook moves. I'm not sure where. Let's say it slides across. And now this knight could plan itself either now or in the next few moves on this nice square. I guess the counterplay here for Nakamura would rely on this knight getting active. I'm not sure that Magnus will want to allow that. Uh, hence, maybe his retreating move that he's chosen in the game. This pawn would be under fire. Maybe the knight could just start jumping into some loose squares. Um, I was going to say the alternative, if we go back, would have been to lock White's knight out of that square, out of any active squares by pushing this pawn. Magnus says, OK, I'm not even going to weaken my structure. He drops back. And now some nasty knight checks to watch out for if you're not careful. And if Hikaru does get active with his knight, Magnus can just take a time out to defend this pawn uh, with his own pawn. And still hard to imagine anything going wrong for a black I think Magnus is playing the match score because if he was just playing a, a game for start of a tournament, he probably would have ventured forward with his knight. But he does not want to allow Hikaru's knight to get to the a5 square, for example, because if that knight is over there, both the b7 and c6 pawns are under attack. And uh, now by bringing his knight to e6, he just is keeping his pieces closer to that side of the board. Uh, the knight can, in fact, hop up to the c4 square. And once black plays f6, yes, that knight can, in fact, go to a5. Uh, there isn't maybe immediately the biggest threat, because if the knight takes on b7, perhaps the rook slides over to b8. But you have to be very careful when you give up pawns on that side of the board. I actually do think it would be hanging, so you would have to slide the rook over to defend. But, I mean, this at least gives Hikaru some hope. I mean, there is an active knight for white, and this is exactly what he's going for. Yeah, it's what he has to go for if he wants to win this game. And maybe the problem here is that you're not quite in time for white. If you had one more move to double up your rooks now and infiltrate the black camp, then great, you might be able to win. But to here, black can neutralize this uh, by bringing his own rook back and sliding across. Just one trade of rooks is enough to ensure that white's rooks never, ever get into the black camp. It's important as well that uh, in a line like this one, that the black knight is on this square because after rook takes rook, the knight jumps back to defend everything. And here, if all the rooks disappear, symmetrical structure, white will never win this game. Uh, he's going for it, and I think the safest, at least, uh, is to go back with the black rook. Maybe Magnus contemplating going more ambitious. No, he chooses a safe approach. I was going to say you could deliver a check, but why bother? You only need to draw. And uh, once the rook lands on d8, Hikaru is going to struggle for winning chances. No! <laughs> we <laughs> want Armageddon! <laughs> But this is too. such a clinical way to play. He just goes for the idea of getting all the pieces off the board and an endgame with just the knights. It looks like it's going to be the white pawns that will need defend defending once the knight comes back into action uh, after the rooks are traded off. Uh, we all want the Armageddon, but this that looks like a far-off dream right now. Yeah, distant dream. And, uh, okay, Magnus takes back he with his knight. A pair of rooks. Yeah. There is a funny trap, though. So if we can bring up an analysis board, you be very, very careful because black wants to make the next move pawn to b6. That would be a huge blunder. If white plays, let's say, b3, some calm move, and you play b6, hoping to kick the knight, rook takes knight is available for white because when the knight takes on c6 for white, that is a fork no matter how black recaptures. So and that's the one thing Magnus look out for. He has successfully done that. Uh, he is not going to fall victim to such a tactical shot. Yeah, really nice geometry there, though, uh, to show the pitfalls that still lie await in wait for black. And OK, meanwhile, Hikaru has given up a pawn. He's opened up a square for his king. It has come at the cost of a pawn, but these guys are a bit ugly. They're not the uh, strongest pawn structure that you'd ever like. And uh, OK, the problem here is, here is how to attack them. Can Hikaru find a way in? Uh, he can drop his knight here, for example, trying to get the rook in. But again, a rook trade for black will save the day. And at the very minimum, instead, he just improves his structure. He pushes his pawn forward. Robert, it's a bunch of your ideas kind of combined. He wants to uh, keep this one on tap for later. Uh, I'm not sure what the direct threat is, but at least it's at least tricky for Magnus to keep control over both sides of the board. If the clocks were reversed, I would say Hikaru has some chances. But unfortunately for him, he's down on time. He's down a pawn. He can't actually quite weasel his way through and create an attack. Uh, the White King at some moment may slide up to G4 just to put pressure on the G5 pawn to keep that knight honest. But you see Magnus' last move. He slides his rook over to C8. He says, I might not just have to sit passively. Maybe I'll push my C pawn, open up my rook. You have to be careful when doing that because the C6 pawn is covering the very important D5 square. 
But Magnus, he's just not going to sit and do nothing. He's just saying you have to think about these things if you're Hikaru. Not just that, he could also advance the B pawn up the board and really kicking that knight out of C4 and then going for the idea of C5 as well, opening up the C5 uh, with the backward pawn on C3. That pawn sacrifice that Hikaru just made, it felt like... Def desperate times call for desperate measures. I don't really see where it's leading. Yes, you create a nice little spot for your king, but Black's knight, Magnus's knight just defends all the pawns, all the weaknesses on the board. And also watch out. Imagine that king does land there, uh, David. At some point, there could be a potential checkmate as well. You might, that rook on f4, if it could magically get there somehow, would actually be a mate. I love how you're actually drawing all the arrows to show the path. But it's a possibility that you need to watch out for. And even if that doesn't happen, where is this king headed? It just looks like Magnus has won a pawn, but what better option did Hikaru have? Yeah, it's about the clock times, as Robert mentions as well. This one is not looking very promising right now. Uh, I still don't think white should lose with best play. I think you're okay here, despite giving up that pawn for not too much. But uh, Hikaru, how does he at least ask one or two more final questions? Uh, your plan on the board, Tanya, that knight kicked back. As soon as you have to start retreating. Oh, Ooh, wow. look at that. That oh, is class. Minute. That is just a whole different class. You know, he doesn't want to move that C-pawn, creating weaknesses in the center. Instead, he liquidates the queen side by advancing the other pawn. And now the rook will slide back, creating another weakness for white down on the A-file, that A2 pawn. This is why it's called the Magnus touch. Yeah. Impressive play. Hikaru, meanwhile, with a really creative knight retreat, he's holding things together. And uh, I'm not sure Magnus wants to actually rush and recapture that white A pawn uh, because there might be an annoying knight jump. Okay, he has gone in. Wow. Now, white's knight is going to go over. Watch out for some forks, <laughs> some checks. But no, Magnus steps out of all the problems, all of the tricks. And Hikaru's knight is caught in two mines. If it goes forward and takes a pawn, Black's rook gets active, snaps off the white A2 pawn. And unfortunately, you have to make a decision. Hikaru only with two minutes, needing a win. But now Black's Rook is active and yeah, it's uh, still nowhere near a win for White, He looks annoyed. Hikaru Nakamura, hope is uh, running out. Here is the tournament trophy that uh, probably Magnus Carlsen will win. And uh, you can also get this trophy. It's up for bidding. A unique trophy each tournament in the Champions Chess Tour 2023. Oh, oh. Whoa. <laughs> Ooh. that's the and that move is almost as nice as that trophy. He just gives <laughs> that pawn where two white pieces can take it. And now he's saying if you take with the king, your king lost contact with the pawn that's behind it on F2. Thank you very much. If you take with the pawn, black springs free an outside pass pawn oh. and some knight checks. I wasn't expecting that move. I was listening to you, Kaya. And suddenly I saw the move played and I was just taken aback. That is beautiful tactical awareness from Magnus Carlsen. He is really earning this championship. Is he finishing? off in style here, Magnus. He is. And uh, I love Robert's reaction because every true chess player, when they see a move like that, it's like, oh, just, oh, yeah, you got to appreciate it. And uh, that's what we call an invisible move when uh, you land something on a square that looks like it's protected multiple times. It looks impossible, but uh, often that breaks the coordination in the enemy army. And look and at look Hikaru. look at the bar. Yeah, he's got a lost position and uh, he knows it, unfortunately. Suddenly too many problems. That white C pawn is about to fall off with a nasty check. That black H pawn, as Robert pointed out, running down the board, racing down to promotion soon. Actually, it's almost resignable, you've got to say. Not just that, there's another problem. The knight can jump into the play by giving a check to the king and really creating all kinds of forks and attacks. Just amazing board vision here by Magnus. First, he breaks on the queen side and then on the king side, sacrificing a pawn. And this just looks like it's we have a result. over. Wow. We have a winner. Magnus Carlsen takes it. He wins the Air Things Masters, the very first event in the Champions Chess Tour 2023. We do see a smile on his face. And what a battle it's been and what a fight Hikaru Nakamura has put on making it all the way to the grand final. But today, Magnus Carlsen was too strong. He finishes it off. And this is Hikaru looking over the game. How impressed are you with Magnus in the tournament, though, Robert? He played amazing chess. I mean, there was that one slip-up against Arjun Aragaisi. He lost that game, and he almost lost Game 3 today. But he showed his resolve. He was able to hold Game 3, and in Game 4, he really had no problems. He's that strong. If you don't make the most of your chances, you may only get one, and then he's going to become the champion. Yeah.
Magnus Carlsen. He uh, wins two games in a huge final, the dream final against Hikaru Nakamura. How impressed are you, Tanya? He was flawless today, start to finish. He took his chances when Hikaru got too risky. He never gave him a chance to come back. And even the one game that he was on the defense, that big game three, that big Hikaru opportunity, he really showed amazing resilience. A completely deserves this win. Hasn't lost a single match throughout. Amazing play. This is why he's the world champion. Yeah. What has been the key to Magnus's success, uh, David? It's just that consistency. Even when he has one bad game, even if he plays one bad move, he pulls himself together. It's just that recovery factor as well, the bounce-back ability that we talk about. Uh, Magnus just never looks flustered. And compared to some of the other top rivals, I mean... Shout out to Hikaru, who played really well this tournament, I've got to say. But compared to those other guys, he just has another level to go up to. And it felt like Magnus activated that level today and uh, took the match. And we're joined by Magnus Carlsen, winner of the Air Things Masters. Big, big congratulations, Magnus. Thank you. Finishing off in style here and starting off the Champions Chess Tour season with a big win. What does this mean to you? Yeah, it's a little bit weird um, since I don't really feel like I did much at all this tournament. So I, I mean, uh, I, I mean, I won. I, usually, like you win preliminaries, you win a lot of matches, but this time it felt like you know you were playing matches from the start. Suddenly, I was in the final and. Uh, um, out of my last nine games, I won one of them and uh, <laughs> I won the tournament. So it feels a little bit weird also since didn't feel like I managed to play close to my best level. But yeah, of course, feeling, winning feels great. Yeah, and I have to say, it's been, even if there hasn't been a lot of decided games, it's been a lot of entertainment. So after this first event in the Champions Chess Tour 23 with a whole new format, what's your verdict on this new Champions Chess Tour? <laughs> yeah, it certainly it certainly leads to um, to uh, you know a lot of close close matches. Um, the Armageddon's and the the bidding and, and all of that uh, adds another layer. Um, frankly, for me, sort of the most exciting part of the tournament was the qualifiers. Uh, I think that's really um, really something good we, we had for for this for this year that you really have to to re work hard to to get into the tournament at all or most players do um yeah as, as for uh as for the tournament uh i think the format is uh, is okay but overall personally i'm a little bit un under underwhelmed um since i didn't feel like uh, the tournament ever really got going in in in, in that sense, uh, but um, I think uh, there will be uh, will will be more excitement to come for sure. Yeah, interesting. And well, we do know for sure now that in event two we're gonna see you have qualified, Hikaru has qualified, Wesley So has qualified, and Fabiano Cariana has qualified for winning division two today, plus four other players that will go through from qualifiers. So. It should be an exciting event too. Yeah, it just means that the qualifiers will be easier. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I think it's it's really good that we we have uh, um, the sort of the cream of the crop playing in, in in these events. It's it's really good to to see. And I have to say for Ikara as well. Uh, I know that uh, he's been fighting through some some difficult stuff in this tournament with his family and i think he'll agree as well um that uh he didn't manage to to show his best level but the fact that he still gets he still gets through the quarterfinal uh sorry qualifier and then all the way to uh the final and makes it uh, makes it close that's um a real testament to his uh uh, to his strength of uh, character and also uh, how how good he is. Definitely. And Magnus, congratulations on this big win. I just want to get your thoughts in today's game. Now, after you won game one, it looked like this was going to be a very tough task for Hikaru. But in that game three, there were a lot of turnarounds that happened and you were on the back foot in that end game. Were you worried at any point? 
Yeah, I mean, I thought I was completely lost. <laughs> uh, I mean, I just couldn't um, like pull myself together in time. And the thing is, when you play on three seconds, uh, compared to 10, you don't really have time at all. So I was playing on instinct, but my instincts weren't working. So that was extremely un impractical. Like I, I spent all of that time trying to find a win. And then I thought I'll bail out into a draw, but I know of course, from experience and everybody knows that when playing, playing him and people know that when playing me as well is that there, as long as you kind of force the draw, then you're not going to get the draw, you know? Uh, then you really have to to earn it, and I, I didn't do it, and uh, he should have um, he should have won the game. And Magnus, you're a huge sports fan. Yesterday was a day off. Were you following the NBA trade deadline? And do you have any uh, fun insights from what you think is going to happen in the remainder of the season? <laughs> yeah, that was fun too. Uh, to follow, I was also watching the um, the Lakers box game uh, yesterday. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, I, I think things have uh, shaken up quite a quite a bit. So uh, I, I was considering um, considering you know taking a trip to the playoffs this year, and my thought was going. Uh, Going east for sure, but now the west looks a little bit more interesting. And um, as my my friend Barca said earlier today, um, maybe Phoenix isn't the worst place to be in uh, in May and, uh, and June. So we'll see. And uh, Magnus, key question: How are you going to celebrate now? Oh, I don't know. It's so early in the day, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, I think I'll uh, grab uh, grab a bite to eat first of all. Say hi to the boys, and then then we'll see. Sounds fun, Magnus. And I uh, have to ask you because we had a challenge for the experts in the studio and the viewers today to uh, bet what the lowest bid in a potential Armageddon would be. Now we didn't get an Armageddon, but can I ask you if you uh, would have gone to Armageddon, what would have been your bid today? We'll see you next time. <laughs> oh, can you give me like ish a number so I have something to uh, finish off the competition? Uh, truth be told, uh, I hadn't thought about it at all. Um, I really wanted to to finish the match off before then. So. All right. Uh, actually, uh, like after the surviving the third game, I was pretty confident. Um, since I didn't think he'd sort of, uh, I feel like that was his his chance. Like both against Wesley and me, he's, he's not had a lot of chances to win. So I thought that was that was it. And also Eric sort of he told me that now you have to play an Armageddon with 15 minutes. Uh, so I thought, yeah, uh, that was my Armageddon today. <laughs> Very cool. Magnus, huge congratulations for, uh, from all of us for winning the Air Things Masters. Thank you. Thank you for joining us and have fun celebrating. We're also joined by Hikaru Nakamura, who gave it a good fight today. Hikaru, a super tough task. You had to win two matches against Magnus today. What was it like? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the match was really came down to a couple of critical moments. I mean, I think in the first game, I just put my knight on the wrong square. And I mean, it's kind of crazy that putting the knight on the wrong square basically led to me getting a horrible position. But, you know, I put this knight on a five instead of e seven in game one. And then after that, I mean, it was just it was difficult. Maybe a computer could have found some better ways to play it. But I thought that Magnus played very principled. And I, I, I mean, I just uh, was a very clean win for him after that. Um, you know, I think really if that's what the match came down to, I wouldn't be super upset. But obviously in game three, Magnus gave me uh, some chances pretty unnecessarily. And I mean, it was a little bit unfortunate that I wasn't able to win that game. I mean, I had a minute against 10 seconds and I was up the pawn and probably winning somehow in the, the rook and pawn ending. But I mean, Magnus defended very well. And that really was was the chance. And after that, I mean, OK, I'd white in the fourth game. But really, uh, when you you mess up a winning position, then it's a must win in the fourth game. It wasn't wasn't there. So yeah, it wasn't meant to be. But that's that's how it goes sometimes. Yeah. And 
Magnus did say in uh, the interview here that, that he thought you would agree that neither of you sort of showed your very best chess, uh, both today and in your match on Wednesday. Would you agree with that? I mean... <laughs> I, I was listening a little bit to what Magnus said. I mean, I'm trying to think of a, a nice way of putting this, but yeah, somehow the whole event felt, uh, it felt very strange. I mean, it seemed like, I mean, my, my match against Wesley came down to one game. Magnus, the first match also came down to one game. This match today, it came down to like one critical moment or two critical moments, both in game one and game three. And yeah, somehow it, it seemed, um, it seemed weird. Like it, it didn't feel like a, a nor normal tournament um, compared to say when I played in 2020 or 2021. So yeah, it was, it was, it was all, it was all a little bit strange for me too. Um, uh, yeah, just, it felt, it felt like you're, you're kind of playing, but you're also not really playing. So yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know what, what else to say really, other than it was just, uh, it all just felt a little bit weird. Yeah. But again, I will say it has been super entertaining. And Magnus was also saying that he's very impressed with, with uh, also your character, because we know you've been going through some uh, tough things this, uh, this week. Uh, has it been a tough week for you? Yeah, I mean, of course, but I'll, I'll talk about that another day. But, you know, I think the, the more important point is that, I mean, I, I think I can say this as I don't play every term in the world is that, I mean, the big difference between me now and say the me of like, let's just say 20, 2014 to 2019, just to use a time period, uh, it's pretty much that I don't just give up. I, I find a way to keep going. And I mean, I think in the past, very easily, I, I, I would have just gone into the third game and I would have lost this game also with black and you know the match is over very quickly and I think um, that's probably the biggest thing for me is I found a way to just sort of keep keep playing keep keep moving forward and not really worrying about anything else and I, I thought today was a great example I mean I, I lost the match but to have that chance in game three especially after losing the first game when it all could have gone downhill um, you know I, th I think uh, I'm, I'm quite happy with that I mean again I didn't win the match but there were a lot of positives to take away from it so yes yeah, you, you just keep fighting you keep trying to play well and uh it's it's certainly it's fun to play against somebody like magnus so i enjoy it great yeah. to hear and uh, hikaru today didn't go your day uh way excuse me but you have so many more events coming up as next we're going to see from you in the pro chess league and title oh, yeah. tuesday um I, I guess something like that i mean I, I haven't even really thought about any of those things actually um yeah I, it's I, again it's very weird because as i said this event it was like it was so short somehow and there were so many matches that that I, again, I'm not trying to be rude here, but there were so many matches that felt very, very boring. Many of the games were very boring, not just mine. Um, and so, like, I, I, I somehow, I guess I, I am looking forward to the Pro Chess League and Title Tuesday a little bit more because I think everybody will take more chances, too. I mean, I, I think when you're playing the best players in the world, for the most part, you have to be pretty solid. You can't take huge risks with, with, uh, with Black in particular. So, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to Title Tuesday and the Pro Chess League. Um, and, yeah, we'll see, we'll see what else I have, but... Yeah, it's you, you just take it one event, one event at a time. But do you think the next event will be tougher? But because we do know you will play Magnus Wesley and now today also Fabiano Carana qualified for event two. Well, I mean, I don't have to play all of them, thankfully. Um, that's the first thing because <laughs> I think you can only lose two matches. <laughs> so I, I mean, I, I won't play all of them. Uh, but you know, to me, uh, I think that's that's kind of uh, that, that's that's a good thing because if I'm being honest, I think even Magnus would probably. I'm not saying he wouldn't qualify, but I think even Magnus would have, would have a, a big uphill battle trying to qualify from the qualifiers. I think if you have to play in that, there's really no guarantee for anybody that you'll make it through. I mean, we saw many great players like Napomniachi, Aroni, and etc. And I mean, they they didn't even qualify. So I think just not having to play the qualifier is is already a, is is already amazing and. Um, so, like, knowing that I have to, like, play as Magnus or Fabian or Wesley, like, yeah, I, I, I don't care. That's, that's just, uh, it's just good that I'm in the event to begin with. Yeah. And uh, finally, Higaro, I've had a competition for the experts in the studio and for the viewers today to bet the winning bid in a potential Armageddon. Now, obviously, we didn't get an Armageddon. But can I ask you, what would you have bid today if we did see an Armageddon? I mean, the, just like Magnus, I, I, I'm not going to answer that. And the main reason I'm not going to answer that is because I'll say with like 99% certainty, there's going to be another Armageddon that that we play in the next event or two. And and honestly, I mean, you can keep bidding lower and lower, but there comes a point where you, in your mind, you know what the absolute lowest time that you can go to is. And so if you just say it, then everyone's going to know that. So, I mean, I, I don't have anything in mind, um, but I would say probably somewhere close to what I bid against Wesley. Mm. Okay. Something close to that. Something close to that. Hikaru, thank you so much for giving us a lot of entertainment this week and uh, for giving us an interview. Thank you. No problem. See you guys soon. See you guys. Yep.
All right. Uh, okay, so we didn't get an answer to the bidding. Should we then use uh, the bids that we had between these two in the winner's final on Wednesday? Ah, oh, I wish I wish I'd known that. Otherwise, I would have changed my, uh, changed my number. 858 and 859. Okay, yeah, we can use that. Okay. Hikaru said closer to the one he bid against Wesley. Mm -hmm. That was 805. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go with the uh -huh. one that he played against Magnus. No, no, no. As in, you should be <laughs> no deciding. I think well, that's that's because bad. that is the only answer we got, actually. Eight. So it's funny because I split the difference. So, you know, I'm, I'm right around the middle of those two. Well, okay, we're going to go with 805 because I don't remember what you guys uh, said. We're going to go with 805, which was the lowest bid we had in Armageddon during the Aerithix Masters. Wait, what's and the he... price for this? Uh, yeah, what is the price? Well, we're I going to, to the good night to celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> so, Let's do it. A glass of something good mm. is the price. So we have Robert betting eight. 29. Mm. Oh, but David's beating you because 814. Yvanka, 838. And Tanya, 901. I would have won it if it was <laughs> the Wesley actually. one. Oh. <laughs> David, you are the winner of the Armageddon competition. <laughs> 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 it's been a lot of fun with the Armageddon, won't you say? It has. I like this new bidding process, and uh, I think it might become more standard place. I'm not sure whether that will happen in FIDE events, but I'd love to see it in World Cups and the like in future. It's it definitely added to the drama. Yeah. And we're going to find a uh, winner uh, from uh, the viewers as well. Uh, the closest to 8.05 will get this AirThinks device signed by... Magnus Carlsen himself. Uh, but before we reveal that, let's take a look at the bracket. The Air Things Masters is over. We started out with some exciting quarterfinals. In the winner's semi-final, Magnus Carlsen knocked Arigaisi down to the loser's bracket. Hikaru Nakamura knocked Wesley so down to the loser's bracket. In their winner's final, Magnus won that match to make it straight through to the grand final. Hikaru Nakamura later joined him. But it was a big match win for Magnus today to win the Air Things Masters, starting off the Champions Jester season in a fantastic fashion. Let's take a look also at the results from Division 2. The winner of Division 2 would secure a spot in Division 1 in uh, the next event. And Fabiano Caruana, he won that match against Yu Yang Yi and is ready for Division 1 in the next CCT event. Division 3 was uh, decided yesterday. The grand final was played between Sam Sevian and Pragnananda, and it was a match win for Sam Sevian as an American. Happy to see that, uh, Robert. You know, I'm not feeling overly patriotic at the moment, but it's great to see the young star, Sam Savian. He did really well in the Chess.com Global Championship. It's great to see him do well in the Champions Chess Tour, and we'll probably see him in a higher division the next time around. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, we also have to take a look at the Tour leaderboard. You get points in each uh, event according to your results. And Magnus Carlsen is on top, of course, with 150 points. Hikaru Nakamura with 100 points. And then a bunch of fantastic players coming in behind there. There are a total of uh, six events in the CCT this season before it all finishes off with a big um, championship. And uh, they also get a lot of money. $235,000 is the total prize fund for the Air Things Masters and Magnus Carlsen takes home today $30,000, $20,000 for Hikaru Nakamura. It's been a uh, great event. It's been a fun day, even if we didn't get Armageddon. But we did get a puzzle from Yovanka today, her favorite puzzle. And it's time to reveal the answer, Ivanka. Yeah, it certainly is. And uh, it's a study by Yuri Dorogov. And uh, I love this puzzle so much. Now, obviously, black has two queens, but the king is in trouble. And a lot of you got the first move right. That is simply to, for the knight to go to c7, give, give a check to the king. And uh, the next move is forced. Queen takes knight. And then comes the critical point. You push the pawn and give a check to the king. And now the king steps forward to c4 square. And if you do notice, the king doesn't actually have too many squares to travel to. It can travel to b3 and can travel to d5. And this is where things get very, very spicy. The queen comes to g8, as many of you saw. And 
Black's best, actually, is for the queen to go to f7 and just give herself away. But that really doesn't save anything because after queen takes queen, and once the queen comes to d5, it's going to be a winning king and pawn ending for white. But this is the key point, and this is why it gets, is basically in my top, top puzzle ever, is because black will actually play queen to d5, blocking the check, and here it comes. It's so beautiful. The king will move to c2. Black, you know, white completely forgets about the queen and says, take it, take the queen. And so black says, yes, thank you very much. And now here it comes. The pawn comes to e4, taking away the last square that the king can go to. And just take a look at those two black queens. They cannot do a single thing to prevent the pawn coming to b3 and giving a wonderful checkmate. Chess beauty. Simply. The, was there a lot of viewers who got it right, Ivanka? There were a few viewers who got it right, Impressive. with a big smile as well. But oh. a lot of people saw the fact, uh, the first, saw the first two moves. Fantastic. Simply chess uh, beauty, you guys. Now, it's going to take us some time to figure out who was closest to 8.05 in uh, the bidding competition. So you'll have to check out who the winner is uh, following the Champions Chess Tour account on Twitter. One lucky winner will get this signed. Air Things device signed by Magnus Carlsen. Now, the next event in the Champions Chess Tour, it starts April 3rd. And uh, we host qualifiers every week for title players. That actually means you guys could play the qualifiers. <laughs> Will you? It sounds like a bit of fun. Yeah. Sounds like a challenge. Why not? But you can't qualify because <laughs> we need you guys in the studio. That's the only reason I wouldn't qualify, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, but is there any chance you guys will just give it a chance? Oh, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I think the initial qualifiers are for non-grandmasters, and then you know they work their way up to yeah. uh, the, the Swiss and then the play-in. Uh, but I think you know the tournament is great because of this. Everyone has a chance to qualify. Uh, everyone has a chance to win. And as Fabiano Caruana said, he's playing people he's not used to playing mm -hmm. who are very, very strong, some up-and-comers, uh, some people who have been around, hovering just below the top tier for a while, but can beat those elite players in any given match. So I do think this Democrat meritocratic system is a great one. And uh, we didn't see too many women in the qualifiers uh, before the Air Things Masters. Tanya, I would like to see some more women. Well, this time it was only open to Grandmasters mm -hmm. and there are not those many women players who have the full title. We did see one, Tan Zongi, play and she had a phenomenal run. In fact, she was also playing in the Women Grand Prix at the same time, mm -hmm. finishing her match there. Then she came in for the Swiss qualifiers and she finished in the second division. Yeah. Had a brilliant play throughout, but I would love to see more female players participating. I'm happy doing the commentary and watching it. But this time, I think it's for all title players. So international yep. masters can also play. Yep. yep. Yeah, I'm going to play that one then. Okay, cool. <laughs> the next chance for all title players is uh, February 13th. And on February 14th, the day after, finally, the Pro Chess League is back. That is super exciting, Robert. It is, and we heard Hikaru Nakamura say there's nothing he loves more on Valentine's Day than playing some chess. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully we'll see him in the Pro Chess League. It's such a great event. It's rare to have a team event in chess outside the Olympiad. David knows a thing or two about success in team events, but it is great. It feels like a lot of fun because you're not doing it just for yourself, but for your teammates. Yeah. You do enjoy the team events, David? I do, and I can confirm I've signed up for a team in the Pro Chess League. So, uh, yeah, I can't wait. Awesome. All right. I'm looking forward to watching, and I'm also looking forward to event two in the Champions Chess Tour. It uh, starts, the main event starts on April 3rd. This was the first one on Chess.com, first Champions Chess Tour 2023 event. It's been so much fun. A lot of drama with Armageddon already looking forward to the next one. A big thank you to everyone who's been with us for sharing your thoughts and questions on uh, Twitter and Twitch. We hope to see you again in the future. But for now, have a good one.
Thank you.